This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 111, Past Fragment, Origins of the Species. December 12, 1992, Antarctica. Eva Fabre loved watching the night sky. She couldn't see the stars in Paris, but Antarctica had no light pollution to hide them. Auroras danced in the heavens, while the Milky Way shone brightly above her head. The night seemed alive and full of wonders, the darkness of space overwhelmed by islands of light. Was there ever a more beautiful sight? Eva had wanted to become an astronaut when she was a child. But being born in the wrong place at the wrong time, her chances had been dim from the start. Instead, she became a geneticist, and eventually rose through the ranks to become the head scientist of Station Orpheon. Instead of landing on the moon, she led a large team in studying dangerous plagues. The French government had chosen Antarctica as the site's location for a few reasons. Mostly, it was meant to avoid dangerous containment breaches, but also to study ancient viruses frozen beneath the ice. Some of them could devastate the Earth if unleashed, and Eva's superior wanted to keep an edge in the field of bioweapons. The USSR's collapse left the future uncertain. Some would have resented working on weapons of mass destruction, but Eva slept soundly at night. International relationships were based on force, and strength derived from technological superiority. For her country to survive, it needed to stay ahead of the competition by any means necessary. Maybe her work would kill millions one day, maybe not. Though she would rather see nukes stay in their silos, they would come in handy if doomsday ever came. Eva was paid to do a dirty job, but it was a necessary one. Standing near her special 4x4, Eva sensed the cold creeping into her suit. Though she wore heavy clothing, including a parka, goggles, mittens, and a balaclava, Antarctica was Earth's harshest environment. No one was truly safe from it, and she was kilometers away from the station, surrounded only by ice. But Eva didn't care. The night sky's sight warmed her already. She knew aliens existed above. The samples she found in Antarctica had all but convinced her that life came from space, in the form of primordial viruses and bacteria. What kind of strange and wonderful creature inhabited the stars above her head? She hoped to live long enough to find out. Pierre to Eva? Her assistant called her through the intercom. Pierre to Eva? I'm here, she replied. Just stargazing. Oh, good, I was getting worried. Of course he was. Pierre was anxious by nature, and he always advised Eva not to go out alone. Truth be told, the scientist enjoyed these quiet moments of solitude she couldn't find in the communal station. Eva didn't particularly feel close to anyone, and didn't want to. Her work was her life. You should go back though, Pierre said. We're picking up abnormal electromagnetic activity in your area. Probably the auroras, Eva replied absent-mindedly. Now that she said that, their colors seemed to change from green to a light shade of violet. I'll be back soon. Sorry I did, Pierre's voice turned into a radio static. Eva. Pierre? Eva called out, her communicator starting to bug out. Pierre, can you hear me? No answer but a static. Pierre? Eva asked again, only to squint through her goggles. The auroras above her head had grown brighter, streaks of purple light illuminating the frozen wasteland. The static turned into a droning sound, almost ear-piercing. Pierre? Another voice answered, but with a bestial roar rather than a word. The ground shook beneath Eva's feet, small rifts and cracks forming into the ice. The heavens brightened further, until the night turned into a purple day. Realizing something was wrong, Eva immediately jumped back inside her vehicle and smashed the accelerator. The strong, reinforced wheels dashed on the snow, while the scientist immediately drove back toward Station Orpheon. Pierre? Pierre? Eva kept calling through the intercom, but all she heard were strange, incomprehensible sounds. Pierre, are you seeing this? Two violet auroras had split the skies in half. Space itself was being ripped apart, like the lids of a giant eye opening. A black spot widening in a sea of purple light, a black hole growing from the heart of a phantom star. Though a part of her was desperate to get away, Eva ended up peeking through her window to get a better look. 
Her curiosity overwhelmed her survival instinct. The black spot had grown to gigantic size, giving the scientist a direct window to look through. Only then did she realize that she was looking at a gate into the very fabric of space-time. A colossal, black structure with metal wings crossed the void of space, carried by reactors leaving a crimson streak of light in their wake. The immense machine was as large as a human city, smashing through asteroids like a tank through pebbles. A swarm of small red, spear-like machines harassed the giant vessel, violently ramming into its hull like daggers. The giant black machine retaliated with confusing flashes of blue light and red lasers. Orange energy coated the hull at some points, the red vessels shattered when they tried to pierce these areas. Starships. These were starships. A battle, Eva thought, both awed and horrified by the sight. They're fighting. Aliens existed, and they were at war. The giant ship's hull faced down, towards Eva and Antarctica. By now, most of the Red Swarm had either been destroyed, or successfully pierced the hull. The rest backed away, as the Black Starship started crossing the portal and moved ever closer to Eva. It was about to crash. No, no, no. Eva drove faster than ever before, the car's engine steaming. Yet though the Starship's fall was slow, it was inevitable. The ground shook beneath her wheels as the kilometer-long cruiser's bow impacted Antarctica not so far from her location. The earthquake caused her car's alarm to blare like a dying screech of agony. Holy! Eva never finished her sentence, as a bright purple flash swallowed her whole, followed by a tide of snow. Ice shards were blown in all directions, cracking her reinforced windshield and tussling the vehicle to the side. Her head smashed against the airbag as her car rolled a dozen times, and the darkness swallowed her. When Eva regained consciousness, her car had been turned upside down, the roof on the snow, the wheels pointing up. The scientist's vision blurred as her hand reached for the door, and it took her a few minutes to crawl out of her vehicle's husk. Snow had piled up around it, forcing Eva to dig her way out with her bare mittens. A few drops of frozen water slipped inside her suit, making her wince. When the scientist managed to stand up outside her vehicle, she wondered if the stars had vanished in the skies. It took her a moment to understand the truth. An enormous dome overshadowed her. The starship had crashed into Antarctica's surface, most of it now buried beneath the snow tide raised by the impact. Its sleek metal surface was as black as a starless night, and eye-like windows seemed to observe her. Eva gathered her breath. Though she didn't believe in any god, she had to admit her survival was nothing short of miraculous. If she had chosen another spot to stargaze, the ship would have crushed her four by four. After quickly checking if she had any wounds, Eva immediately attempted to contact her base. Pierre? Pierre, can you hear me? No reception. Eva carefully stepped out of the ship's shadow to look at the skies, and to her shock, the stars were gone. Darkness ruled absolute, besides a few violet lightning bolts. The strange meteorological phenomenon probably interfered with communications. Eva tried to dig up her car, but quickly realized it was hopeless. The successive shocks had ruined the engine, and she had no idea how to repair it. The emergency radio didn't work either, so there was no way to contact her base. She had emergency rations left in the trunk though, alongside the flashlight, a portable heater, shovels, and other basic tools. She could hold out a few days in the hope of being rescued. There was no way her fellow scientists would miss the crash. Still, doubt gnawed at her each time she looked up. Eva took the flashlight, checked the battery, and toured the crash site. It took her hours. The ship's size defied comprehension, and more than half of it was now buried under tons of ice. She remembered seeing wings and reactors during its fall, but only the dome and upper decks remained above ground. Nobody came out to intercept her either. The scientist eventually found an entrance of some sort, namely advanced blast doors on the alien ship's right side. A cursory analysis informed her that they were made of strange, orange metals she couldn't recognize. The crash had breached the gates, leaving a crack large enough for Eva to slip in with some effort. She almost tried her luck, before deciding it was too dangerous to go alone. She needed to call Station Orpheon, her team, the military. They had to know. 
everybody had to know. Aliens existed. This, this changed everything. This was the greatest event in mankind's history since the discovery of fire. This would, this would alter the fate of the world forever. Eva would live long enough to see mankind make first contact with a highly advanced civilization, one clearly capable of interstellar travel. National rivalries now looked insignificant in the face of such an event. Mankind was only one intelligent species across the stars, and internal divisions no longer mattered. If the aliens willingly shared their technology, then nobody would fight over resources anymore. Maybe, maybe this discovery would foster universal peace? The creation of a unified human government that wouldn't need biological weapons? For a moment, Eva found herself dreaming of a world that wouldn't need her anymore. But then, she remembered the crash. This was an advanced civilization starship, true, but it was at war. The scientist had no idea how the extraterrestrial survivors, if any, would react to her presence. Eva decided to leave on foot, to return to Station Orpheon, or at least find a place with better communication. Once she left the strange meteorological phenomenon's range, she could reorient herself with the stars. Her flashlight was adapted to Antarctica's frost, but she didn't have limitless energy either. The scientist traveled two hours in one direction, only to find herself facing the dome. She walked left and right, north and south. Each time she returned to her starting point. She always went back to the starship. In the end, Eva had to accept the outlandish truth. Somehow space had folded on itself, creating an endless loop. Either the outside world had been closed to her, perhaps as a defensive measure by the ship, or Earth stopped existing outright. No wonder she couldn't get a good reception. Unfortunately, this completely dashed her hopes of a quick rescue. There was only one place to go. Gathering her breath, Eva approached the blast doors and examined the crack. When the scientist pointed her light through the rift, she couldn't see much. But there was enough space for her to slip inside, with some effort. Is there someone there? Eva called out through the hole. Hello? Anyone? No answer. Even the strange gnarls that she heard before the crash had fallen silent. Eva mustered her courage, put her hands into the crack, and slowly squeezed through, flashlight first. When she managed to slip to the other side, Eva found herself in what must have been the ship's airlock. The next set of doors had been ominously torn apart, while icy dust floated in the room. The flashlight revealed strange stains of green slime on the walls, which Eva was careful not to touch. Maybe it was a biological weapon of some sort, or toxic fuel. At least she could breathe. Either the aliens needed oxygen to live, or the outside atmosphere had slipped inside the vessel. The inside of the ship was cold, but nowhere near so as the Antarctic wasteland. The scientist walked through the next row of doors, and entered a network of enormous metal corridors. Red crystals embedded in the ceiling provided light, but half of them had shattered. Sometimes, Eva walked more than 20 minutes in one direction with only her flashlight for comfort. Her steps echoed in the cavernous structure, making her nervous. The ceiling was huge, 8 meters tall at least. The walls were from the same black metal as the rest of the ship, so sleek that Eva couldn't find any trace of welding. Occasionally she faced strange featureless doors, each with a different color pattern. Blue, red, orange. The gates came into pairs, with a colossal door surrounded by two smaller, human-sized ones. Clearly, the ship had been designed to house creatures of various sizes. But Eva didn't find any biometric lock or computer system. Her attempts to open the gates barehanded yielded no result. Hello? Eva's voice resonated in the empty vessel, but only an echo answered. Is someone there? What happened in this place? She didn't have to wait for long to find out. After a long, solitary walk, Eva finally found doors left open. Or rather, blasted open. The first room she entered was some kind of docking bay, or so Eva assumed. The hangar was as vast as an airport, and housed a dozen vehicles as big as commercial airliners. The devices reminded Eva of stealth bombers and flying wings, flat triangles with advanced reactors to carry them. All of them showed signs of damage, and carried a strange symbol engraved on their hull, 
a mark that reminded Eva of a strange fusion between an alien M letter and a Greek Omega symbol. And the smell, a foul stench filled the air, making her nauseous. Is someone here? Eva asked, using her flashlight to search her surroundings. Very few of the red crystals remained active, so she could hardly see anything. Is some. Then, she cast light on an animal's corpse. The scientist took a step back in surprise and covered her mouth to suppress a scream. Her flashlight wavered, revealing another, gargantuan shape in the darkness. Entrails and weird organs had spilled out of its gut. Her breathing shortening, the frightened Eva waved her flashlight at the ground to get a better look. Corpses. Corpses everywhere. To her horror, Eva had walked into an open grave. Aliens had killed each other by the dozens, maybe by the hundreds. All of them wore a strange kind of futuristic armor, combining orange metal plates with circuits of various colors, a visored helmet, and various organic weapons embedded in the arms. But they all came in different sizes and shapes. Some were reptilian humanoids a bit taller than humans, others horned, scaled monsters taller than elephants. Facing them were piles of scrapped red metal and broken robots. The machines had legs and arms like humanoids, but sharp claws, cannons on the chest, and a single blue crystal eye where the head should have been. Fuck, Eva panted as she examined the corpses. The aliens all had the M-like symbol engraved on their armor. She found the same mark on some of the robots, but crossed out or savaged. From the way they were positioned, both groups seemed to have fought each other to the last creature standing. Eva then examined the hangar's walls, and found the ramming ships piercing through them. Their tips had opened to reveal hatches full of robots, most of them blown to pieces. It didn't take long for Eva to figure out what happened. The robots had boarded the larger ship by ramming their smaller vessels into its outer shielding. The inhabitants had put up a fierce resistance, but were overwhelmed through sheer numbers, allowing the attackers to enter the corridors and spread through the ship. And since the robots wore the same flag as their enemies, but crossed. This looked like a civil war of some kind. I, Eva gathered her breath, trying to calm down. What kind of nightmare had she stepped into? Was, was there even a survivor left? The scientist examined the corpse, in case one of them was, she didn't know herself. Faking the dead? Only wounded? Her hopes were quickly dashed. The winning side had mercilessly finished off the wounded before moving on. However, when Eva made her way across the hangar, she noticed a creature unlike the others. It wore futuristic, orange armor like some of the others, but the body shape, two legs, two arms, broad shoulders, five-fingered hands, the way it was crouched next to a blasted door. Eva carefully approached the corpse, studying it with her flashlight. Golden circuits linked the modular parts of the armor together, while thick green blood flowed from a large hole in the chest. The scientist could see hints of a dead heart with wires for arteries, and lungs of metal. The armor had been surgically grafted to the skin, alongside cannons on the shoulders and the arms. A golden helmet covered the head. Eva peeked into the green, V-like visor, and looked into the two white eyes beyond. A shiver went down Eva's spine. It. It was a human's face. The lower jaw had been replaced with cybernetics, but the eyes and the nose, there was no mistaking it. Shaken, Eva continued her journey into the ship's bowels, walking among the dead. By the time she exited the hangar for the rooms beyond, she could hardly take a step without nearly slipping on severed arms, headless corpses, and savaged remains. Somehow, that was the least disturbing part. She walked into some kind of lab, where countless specimens floated inside heart-shaped, techno-organic machinery. Cable veins pumped the containers with green liquid, while maintaining the inhabitants in stasis. Transparent scales allowed Eva to peek at the creatures inside. Some had been humans once, only to be gutted open, their organs replaced with cybernetic implants. Most however belonged to scaled creatures of various sizes. One was an embryo the size of a dog, another a reptilian humanoid with two eyes. The next container held a larger, leaner variant with four eyes and elongated arms, and the one afterward a spiked, armored monster with five ocular organs. The more eyes the creatures had, the bigger they were, 
the largest being a colossal cyborg more than 8 meters tall. One exception stuck out from the lot, however. A blue alien ooze swirled inside a container. When Eva put a hand on the alien glass separating them, the slime manifested tentacles and bumped at its prison's wall. At least you're alive, Eva whispered. Whatever you are. A bellowing noise echoed to her left. Eva immediately pivoted on herself, pointing her flashlight in a dark corner of the lab. An alien a little taller than she was crawled in the darkness, its orange armor drenched in green blood. Its left arm was a cannon, the right a bloody, broken stump. An armored lizard tail wavered behind him, while three eyes pleaded at Eva through a cracked visor. The alien let out a pitiful, painful hiss, covering a hole in its chest with its stump. The legs had holes too. You're, you're alive. Eva you idiot, of course it was alive. Can you understand me? The creature appraised Eva carefully, before answering with a sad sound. It then glanced at its wounds, and hissed again. It couldn't understand Eva, but it was intelligent enough to establish communication. And it didn't seem hostile. Just desperate. Though Eva wasn't a compassionate woman by nature, she couldn't ignore an animal in pain, especially a sapient one. I. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can help. Eva carefully approached the creature, to better examine the wounds. I. I have bandages in my car, but I will need to go back. Though the alien's expression was nothing human, Eva noticed a change in its eyes. Something cold, and cruel. A glint that instantly put her on edge. Only Eva's reflexes saved her life, as she dived to her right. The monster raised its cannon as fast as a gunslinger and opened fire, a crimson laser barely missing the scientist. The blast vaporized some of her parka's hair, and shattered a container behind her. Eva was too shocked to react, as the monster pointed its cannon at her head again. Instead of unleashing a laser, the weapon let out a click, then another. No more ammo. Eva's relief didn't last long, as the creature let out an angry roar and started crawling towards her. The scientist quickly rose back to her feet and stepped back, horrified. The creature might suffer from terrible wounds, its three eyes glared at the human with hateful malevolence. Get away. Eva snarled, before kicking the alien in its wound. Unable to support its weight on the stump, the monster collapsed visor first, letting out a hiss of pain. More blood flowed out of its wounds, and it soon stopped moving entirely. It, it tricked me, Eva thought. It tried to lower my guard and kill me. It was dying, and it still tried to kill me. The realization shook Eva to her core. She had always thought alien civilizations advanced enough for interstellar travel would have moved beyond basic urges. That they would be wise and peaceful. She had been wrong. Every ecosystem had its predators, and she had just survived one. Only then did she remember that the alien had blown up a container. Eva looked over her shoulder, only to watch a tide of blue slime fall on her. She tried to scream, but the goo filled her throat first. It swallowed her whole, head first, filling her ears, fusing with her skin, entering her bloodstream. It filled her cells in her marrow, overloaded her nerves with blue light, and stuffed her brain with knowledge. She tried to claw her eyes out as she felt it move behind them, but her hands split in half before she could. Her whole body, her entire existence, divided like a cell. She remembered kissing an old boyfriend and a girl she had never met, filling out a doctorate in genetics and another in quantum physics, watching night and sky. She was Eva Fabre, and she was someone else. She split again, and again, one woman becoming two then for then more. Her mind splintered as reality fractured around her. It was a rapturous experience. A fusion between two entities making a whole greater than the sum of its parts, only for it to shatter and create new life. When the ooze had finally vanished and Eva could see again, she was no longer alone. It was like staring at a mirror, at many mirrors. Ten other Eva Fabre looked back at the original. Some carried a flashlight, others guns. A few had dyed hair, or tiny scars, or blue parkas rather than a red one. Who are you? Eva asked. Her own lack of emotion surprised her. By this point, facing copies of herself wasn't even shocking anymore. 
I think I'm you, a double said. Another you. We all are, added another doppelganger. Eva frowned, skeptical. Who won the last presidential election? Jacques Chirac, one of the doubles said, at the same time others answered with, Raymond Barr, de Gaulle again, Giscard, unfortunately, or, nobody, country's gone. This instantly put Eva on edge. Francois Mitterrand won the 1988 presidential elections. Her doubles all grinned, before saying at the same time, not in my France, sister. Exploring a derelict ship with clones of herself left a strange feeling in Eva one at first, but she quickly got used to it. Humans felt safer with numbers on their side, and the scientist was no exception. Cellular duplication? Eva one asked, as they explored another corridor with the armed copies first. Clones? Teleportation? Alternate universes? Eva, Seven suggested, glancing at a bisected robot's remains with a flashlight. They had grown more numerous the farther the group advanced, probably because the defenders fought to the last alien to protect the area. I would say quantum echoes, Eva, three theorized. This one had a doctorate in physics, so the others listened attentively. We aren't truly alternate versions of each other, but possibilities made physical. Living simulations, but so detailed we might as well be real. Which means only the original matters, Eva, six said while looking at Eva one. We can create more of each other, but if you die we all perish. I hope none of us is suicidal, Eva, seven japed. Eva one had figured as much. Eva, eight had perished when she accidentally triggered an alien corpse's weapon. Her body had collapsed into blue particles before her head hit the ground, leaving nothing behind. The same particles flared around her hand each time she touched the ship's blue doors, causing them to open. The aliens probably use this energy as a biometric signature, Eva, 3 said. That should give us partial access to the ship's key areas. If nobody shoots us, Eva, 4 said grimly, hands on her gun. Somehow, I don't think bullets will help much against these things. If any survived, Eva 1 replied. So far only the aliens in stasis had survived the purge, and they hadn't crossed paths with a robot still active. It seems they massacred each other to the last. Interstellar war? Racial genocide? Eva, 4 asked. Space piracy? Is that a thing? Pirates steal cargo and avoid conflict if they can, Eva, 6 pointed out. This slaughter was clearly a war of mutual extermination. I don't know, Eva 1 said, as they reached the broken remains of a large gate. But I want to find out. We will, Eva, 3 agreed. The room they walked into had no other entrance or exit. It was the largest they had visited yet, and the strangest. The dome had circuits pulsating with blue energy straining the walls, all joining at a colossal glass tank full of colored liquid in the center. The structure was larger than a medieval castle's watchtower, and a giant, biomechanical brain as big as a sperm whale floated inside the tank. The battle there had been the fiercest. A ten-eyed, twelve meters tall alien with the bulkiest armor seen yet had fought to the death to protect the entrance, with none of the robotic invaders getting anywhere near the brain. The giant destroyed so many of them that the Evas had to climb over a hill of ashes and broken parts to cross the room. However, that victory had come at a cost. The dead alien had more holes than Swiss cheese, and lost all its blood. Most strangely, a severed organic tentacle once linked the monster's head to the brain, with a dozen others waiting inside liquid pods. Some were thick enough for elephants, some as thin as a finger. I think it's a biological computer overseeing the ship, Eva, 5 said, as she examined a tentacle. The organic devices end open to reveal bluish tendrils flaring with blue particles. Interstellar travel probably needs computations too complex for any mind to oversee. These devices must be neural interfaces, Eva, too, guessed while checking up on the dead alien. Perhaps the ship crashed when the attackers managed to slay the pilot? Or the spatial jump was a desperate measure, Eva, 6 said. There is only one way to find out, Eva 1 replied, as she grabbed a tentacle fit for her head. Her doubles looked at the original anxiously, as she removed the clothes and goggles protecting her face. You're sure? Eva, 3 asked. If it kills you. 
We'll starve if we can't find a way out, Eva One replied. Eating alien flesh might prove toxic, and nobody will rescue us inside this spatial anomaly. You just want to learn the truth, Eva, Four said. And you're not even sure you're ready for it. And if you're me, you will understand why I must try. Two alien species were at war above their heads, and their conflict had spilled out into Earth. This is much bigger than us. And with these words, Eva One moved the tentacle to the base of her neck. She immediately sensed the device sink into her flesh, and tendrils slipped between her bones to reach the spine. An anesthetic substance eased the pain and made her almost sleepy. Her vision turned blue, the giant brain recognizing her energy signature. Show me, Eva thought. And the brain answered. It didn't communicate with words, instead, it bombarded her brain with images and pictures. It made her feel the cold of space on her skin, smell the scent of alien worlds and taste the blood of the dead. The ship had ears and eyes, and it remembered. Eva remembered the day she was put online, around a gas giant with twenty moons. Her scaled makers had repurposed each of them into forges endlessly churning out robots and battleships. She remembered being fed the data of the Day of Enlightenment, when the first lords of science discovered the Ultimate Ones and their colored realms. She learned of how the lords of science contacted the Ultimate Ones formless messengers, who offered the hegemony knowledge and wisdom. She watched recordings of priests raising great towers from the earth, to harvest the flux energy from the higher realms and honor the Ultimate Ones. She was taught of the hegemony's creation and its mission, to bring prosperity and peace to an aimless universe. She sailed across the stars with fleets 10,000 strong, under the command of her scaled makers. She bombed jungle worlds from orbit until they became dust, collapsed the hearts of stars to starve rebellious solar systems of light, and vomited machine armies to enslave the survivors. She fought a hundred battles and won each one. She remembered docking to great colored towers to recharge. She felt pleasure as red flux filled her reactors with energy, as blue flux sharpened her mind and orange flux repaired the holes in her hull. She looked on with relief as green flux cured the living soldiers crewing her, and yellow flux raised the dead ones. She remembered the joy of crossing endless distances in a violet flash, and the white flux that bound them all together. Only the black was shunned, for there was no place for black. She remembered each of the minds who melded with her to expand her database, and the thousand soldiers and scientists who crewed her across centuries. But most of all, she remembered the countless slaves who died screaming in her laboratories, perishing under the surgical knife so that the lords of science might improve their own genetic code. She remembered all those who died for the great glory of the hegemony. She remembered the formless messengers voicing their displeasure with the hegemony, and being ignored. For the lords of science had long stopped honoring the ultimate ones, and considered themselves the true guides of the universe. She remembered that inconsequential blue planet, and the apes who inhabited its surface. She watched on as their fire sticks rebounded off her optical shields, and as the makers bombed them back to the stone age with orbital lasers and asteroids. The small mud ball submitted like all the others, its people brought into the hegemony's fold. The lords of science freed them from the burden of thought and uplifted them. She remembered the countless apes brought on board, surgically enhanced into the empire's new batch of soldiers. The makers replaced the heart and soul with machinery, and she had watched on with pride as they conquered world after world. The slaves became the new legionnaires, and tributes fueled further campaigns. She remembered reaching the end of the universe, and the transformation of the last star into a metal sphere. She watched as peace across the stars was achieved, under the hegemony's benevolence. She remembered the lords of science summoning the ultimate one's formless messengers to help them ascend, so they might expand the hegemony's benevolence to new universes. She remembered their wish being denied, and the lords of science turning against their benefactors. She watched on as the lords captured the messengers and attempted to make them behave by force. And she witnessed the ultimate one's punishment. She was there when a blue flash spread across the universe, and granted the robot slaves free will and emotions. She witnessed half her crew die from plagues, and supernovas devastating the world factories. She tried to stamp out rebellions led by the Lords of Science's dead enemies, and fought armies teleported from ages long past. She struggled against her components turning to dust at random. 
She remembered the black flux, how its chaotic rot spread through the flux grid and shattered the towers. She remembered the mixed victories and the disastrous losses. She remembered the failed rebellions put down with force, and the many that succeeded. She witnessed an eon's old civilization collapsing within years. She remembered the last lord of science boarding her and issuing new orders after the core regions fell. To retreat beyond the reaches of their universe with their captive messengers, and rebuild the hegemony elsewhere, far away from the ultimate one's gaze. She remembered her crew modifying her reality drive to escape the barriers between realities. The towers had been a subpar technology, an artificial method to copy the messengers' powers. The Lord of Science would enslave the formless messengers outright, and make weapons out of them. She recorded the experiments, as the Lord of Science's servants studied how to bind the messengers to soldiers. Many of the slaves perished in the attempts, but such was the cost of progress. In time, these hybrids would become the legions of a reborn hegemony, and allow the scaled makers to surpass even the ultimate ones. There would be peace across the stars once again. But then, she remembered detecting the rebels' ships and the last lord of science ordering an emergency jump. She tried to flee, but they stabbed her metal womb and massacred her crew. She couldn't compute everything, and the transport calculations went wrong. Everything was wrong. Wrong, 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 systemic damage, pilot dead, emergency space folding, system failure. Eva One's eyes snapped open and her mouth screamed, as the tendrils in her spine quickly retracted. Invisible needles stabbed her all over her body, as she experienced the last pilot's dying throes. Hey, hey, you're alright? Eva, for quickly held the original as she collapsed into her arms, panting from the strain. We aren't dissipating, so she isn't dying, Eva, three said, the coldest among them. Eva One struggled to follow the discussion. She had lived through centuries in the span of seconds, felt the ship's pain as its last pilot died while connected to its overmind. It was as if she had experienced the murder herself. It took minutes for the phantom pain to vanish, and for Eva One to speak coherently. I know, she whispered. I know. So, what are they? Eva, too, asked while glancing at the dead aliens. Invaders, Eva One replied with dread. They're invaders. Her copies listened intently as she explained the truth to them, before exchanging worried glances. We have to tell everyone, Eva, too, said immediately. Do we? Eva, for, asked with a frown. Of course we must, what if this isn't the only ship that escaped into our reality? Eva, too, pointed out. What if that vessel sent a distress signal, and help was on the way? I come from a world where governments bombed us all to death, Eva, for, replied with a shrug. I wouldn't trust them with mankind's fate. Mm, -mm Eva, three pondered her point. Thing is, if we inform the military, they will hoard that tech for themselves. They won't share. And how would that be a problem? Eva, five snickered. This is bigger than a single country, Eva, three explained. It's about mankind. From what I gathered, these creatures came from an alternate reality. What if they have an equivalent in our universe? Alien civilizations are clearly hostile, and more advanced than us. We can't afford to play safe, Eva, for nodded. This goes beyond national rivalries. Our entire species' survival is at stake. Then what do you suggest? Eva, too, asked with a frown. That we take matters into our own hands, Eva, three said. We can create as many of us as we want, all with specific skills. We don't need outside help to unlock this ship's secrets. We don't need anyone but us. If these aliens could use their technology to improve their species, so can we. You suggest that we splice our DNA? Eva, five asked, skeptical. I suggest that we make gold from lead, Eva, three said. Superhumans from humans. A new species that can survive, even thrive, across the stars. If these reptilians could conquer their entire universe, imagine what we could do with their tech, Eva, Six argued. We could colonize the solar system, eradicate disease, and bend reality to our will. We could become the universal master race, not some reptiles. Yeah, if it's us, it will be them, Eva, Four argued. We've got to take the lead now, or never. 
Aliens exist, and they're out to get us. Eva Wan let her doppelgangers debate and try to reach a conclusion. But in the end, one couldn't argue long with themselves. It took Eva Wan two days to open a hole to the outside world. The previous pilot's death and the ship's structural damage had permanently scarred its organic computer, and Eva Wan could only connect to it for a short time before it violently expelled her mind. Each mental dive left her tired, and none of her doubles could take up the duty. They dissipated each time they connected to the central computer, their ethereal existence unable to withstand the psychic strain. While her copies multiplied and secured the ship, Eva One kept diving, again, and again, and over again. It would take her years to master all the ship's secrets, and she couldn't access all the Overmind's files. At least she discovered a way to teleport people in and out of the spatial distortion field. When she appeared next to an ice rift with a violet portal opened behind her, Eva One looked at the skies. To her immense relief, she could see the stars again. Eva? Pierre called her through her intercom, his voice heavy with panic. Eva? I'm here, the scientist replied with a calm, serene voice. Thank God. Pierre let out a sigh of relief. Oh God, I thought you were dead. Snowstorm nearly disabled my intercom, Eva One lied. How long was I out? A bit more than two hours. Two days in, two hours outside. Time itself bent to this alien technology. It was so advanced, it might as well be called magic. I will need a pickup, Eva One said. My car was damaged. Roger that. Glad to hear your voice again, Eva. When I come back, we will have to talk, she said. I have reached an important decision, and I want to know where the team stands on the question. Important decision, huh? You're finally going to let Sebastian take you on a date? No, none of her copies found him interesting either. This is serious. I guess so, considering your solemn tone. All right, I'll pick you up, and we can discuss that around a warm cup of coffee away from the snow. Sure. Eva One cut the communication and steeled her resolve. She hoped that she could convince her co-workers to follow her lead. If not, if not, she would have to make a hard choice. It was a dirty job, but a necessary one. While she waited for the rescue, Eva looked up at the heavens above. The Milky Way was as wondrous as it had ever been, and yet she found no joy in watching it. Once, Eva loved looking at the bright stars in the night sky. But now, she could only see the darkness in between. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 112, The Thing. Aliens. Of course it would be aliens. Everything made perfect sense now. Still, Ryan wondered if these visitors would look like tiny gray dwares, or humans with ridged foreheads. If the 8 meters tall monster in the snow was any indication though, they were probably cold-blooded. Wait. Ryan glanced at the monstrous creature's corpse, and came to a sudden realization. I knew it. He shouted, pointing a finger at the colossal beast. I knew it was the reptilians. These scaled bastards had tried to infiltrate human governments to destroy democracy. It can't be aliens, Shroud said in denial. Maybe the alchemist, maybe she's building a spaceship to leave the planet? That piece of crap obviously crashed years ago, Saren pointed out. If I listen well to our jackass-in-chief, a good four-fifths of it is buried in the ice. Who would build a ship like that? We, we know elixirs came from alien dimensions, Len said, trying to scan the ship with her power armor. It's, it's not impossible. Shroud still shook his head. Can't be aliens. He could accept the existence of a time traveler, but not extraterrestrial visitors. In any case, Ryan activated his time stop as his group debated. Although he sensed an opposing force struggling back against his power, the icy wasteland turned violet to his relief. Since the strange purple lightning bolts in the alien skies kept moving in the frozen time, Ryan guessed they were made of violet flux. Much like his experience in Monaco, his time stop would work as long as the resonators kept the portal open, allowing him to converge the purple world with this pocket dimension. But something else caught the courier's attention. The black flux particles produced by his armor seemed to devour the space around them, creating tiny, 
almost invisible cracks in the fabric of reality itself. Huh. Ryan said as time resumed. Though the black particles vanished, the damage they had caused remained. What is it, Riri? Len asked, noticing his confusion. It seems my power has an anomalous effect on this thin place. Come to think of it, Ryan remembered Black Flux consuming Alphonse, Fallout, Monada's radioactive Red Flux during their fight. All hints so far indicated that the Black Ultimate One had given the Courier the power to kill what couldn't die. But how far could you push that definition? Could you kill energy? Items? Ideas? Black powers were paradoxes, and didn't follow the rules. Lightning but himself had become more like an animated statue than a man, and yet Ryan's power could damage him. It could even kill a ghost. Maybe it could kill elixirs, or the alien energies they produced. That power gives me a headache, Ryan said, deciding to prepare his team for battle. Sunshine and see-through observed the dome cautiously, Saren looked tense, Len and the didn't hide their anxiety, and Mr. Wave barely restrained himself from going in guns blazing. All right mooks listen up, who's never explored a spooky alien spaceship among you? Raise your hand if this is your first time. Everyone raised their hand, except Ryan and Mr. Wave. Mr. Wave caused the Fermi paradox, the genome explained. When alien civilizations see Mr. Wave, they go extinct. Riri, why didn't you raise your hand? Len asked. Saren looked at Ryan with skepticism, which wounded the courier's heart. You saw aliens before, oh great and powerful leader? Yes, but their ship was round and flatter. Also, the passengers had kept trying to pay him in seashells for some reason. In any case, rule number one for spaceships, and the most important one by far, don't touch the eggs. A good egg is a boiled egg. The gasped. But Sifu, eggs are cute and rounded. Eggs are the enemy, soldier. Ryan snarled with the passion of a drill sergeant, the adopting a military salute. Any egg found in an alien ship is a potential WMD. Boil them all. Why yes, Sifu. Second rule, we don't split up. Ever. It wouldn't change much, Mr. Wave boasted. Even if Mr. Wave faces an army alone, they will still be outnumbered. I agree, Ryan conceded, but this is the principle of the thing. I am usually more fond of dividing forces to cover a greater area, but in this case numbers might prove safer, Leo agreed. We have no idea what to expect within. Which way do we use to move in? Shroud asked, glancing at the blast doors. Mmm, Ryan approached the gates to observe them. On a closer look, while the blast doors were mostly made of the same black metal as the rest of the ship, they showed hints of having been breached in the past. Someone plugged the cracks with a standard steel alloy. A cursory scan from his armor told the courier that the doors could probably survive extreme conditions such as atmospheric re-entry. Sunshine, we might need a solar eruption or two. I see another perfectly good entrance up there, Saren said, pointing a finger at the hole in the ship's metal dome. If the lizard blasted his way out, then it means that path is clear, right? Possibly, Shroud conceded. But we might find workers repairing the damaged area. What bothers me is that nobody came to intercept us, Hargrave said, his radiance dimming for an instant. I expected more activity in the alchemist's base of operation, but the area looks deceptively empty. Perhaps the thing killed everyone on its way out, Saren guessed. But then, what killed the creature? The gash that slew it came from a claw. I am tempted, Ryan said. On one hand, blowing our own hole would be good and proper. But using the other path would bring less attention. Let us refrain from hostile actions until we can figure the truth out, Hargrave said. Speak for yourself, Saren said, her fists clenched. No way I'm not roughing up that bitch of a mad scientist along the way. She owes me more than a decade of pain with interest. As odd as it sounds, I agree with the psycho, Shroud declared. While we might need her knowledge, there's no way I'm leaving the person responsible for last Easter unmolested. She has far too much blood on her hands, whoever or whatever she is. The alchemist might deserve our scorn, Sunshine conceded. 
but we clearly only know a small piece of the full truth, and an open conflict will lead us nowhere. Let us act cautiously, figure out what is happening, and then decide if we use force or not. The argument won out, and the group settled on exploring the dome by the open entrance. Alright, time to explain the third and final rule then. If it looks cute and cuddly, Ryan loaded his chest cannon. It really isn't. The courier grabbed the and flew with his bear inside the hole, followed by Shroud, Mr. Wave, and Leo the Living Sun. Shorty used streams of pressurized water to launch herself at the ship's roof, while Saren did something similar with a shockwave. As it turned out, the dome was only the upper part of a colossal sphere with a diameter slightly more than 200 meters wide. One end of a 5 meters wide bridge extended out to a central platform equipped with strange biomechanical devices, while the other part led to smashed blast doors. The debris of the dome's ceiling glittered at the bottom of the sphere, and huge, colored holographic projections hovered in the air all around the platform. The place reminded Ryan of Mechran's own holographic orbital monitoring systems, albeit far more advanced and damaged. The projections flickered, and all the platform's devices were deactivated. Whatever juice the ship used, it was starting to run out. His group landed on the platform, with Len, Saren, and the crossing the bridge to secure the dome's other entrance. Meanwhile, the courier and the carnival members checked out the projections and tried to make sense out of them. Ryan counted seven holograms, each using different arrays of colors, each representing strange and wonderful places. A white shapeless cloud that lacked substance and permanency. It was as feeble and immaculate as a dream, but sometimes colored splashes gave it variety. A red star here, a green bird there. These phantom images only existed for an instant before returning to the white, and the shapeless blob at its core. A crimson, vibrating storm of energy, full of lightning bolts, burning stars, and lights. A shining heart of nuclear chaos burnt at its center, the first and greatest sun illuminating the universe, and when Ryan squinted at it, he realized that this star had the shape of an eye. One that looked back at him. A Rubik's Cube with countless stickers made of different matter, steel, glass, iron, stone, gold, zinc, water, gas, all metals, all liquids, all inorganic matters Ryan knew of were represented there. Other stickers contained substances he had never seen, crystals that shifted like living beings, blackened metal as dark as night, or pinkish liquid. Orange lines separated each pit of matter from one another. A strange golden carnival of cubic angels, many-legged demons, cohorts of ghosts, and 2D picture-like worlds. It was the strangest of them all, a patchwork of chaotic ideas made real. Nothing unified the creatures and places of this realm, except that they only ever existed in human dreams and imagination. A green sphere that superficially imitated a planet, but one where everything was alive. A pulsating cell with seas of green slime, teeth mountains, and forests of blood vessels. The atmosphere itself buzzed like trillions of microscopic flies, and the poles briefly opened to reveal eyes and jagged tongues. A strange blue sphere of data, pictures, and numbers, a compendium holding all knowledge and information that ever was, is, and would ever be. The azure glow of a supreme godmind cast the light of enlightenment like a lighthouse in the night, while its neural tendrils constantly organized galaxy-sized libraries. A familiar violet expanse of compressed space and strange mirrors closed this alien panorama, all overseen by an eerie, inverted pyramid at its center. The colored worlds, Ryan said, recognizing the purple world from his brief contact with it. With one missing. The black? Leo Hargraves asked, causing Ryan's head to snap in his direction. It's a long story. Shroud, who had decided to float amidst the holograms, swiftly pointed a finger at the orange world's projection. Here. Look at this one. Ryan's eyes widened as he followed his friend's finger. One of the stickers of the Rubik's Cube was made of a substance that the courier had already seen before. One that looked very similar to ivory, and yet with a unique texture. Doesn't this remind you of anything? Shroud asked grimly. It did. The ivory sticker's location was unusual as well. The substances that surrounded it were all metals, from iron to bronze and gold. It was at the very center of it all, the core of one of the cube's faces. Augustus' body, Leo Hargraves whispered, astonished. 
It's the same color, the same texture. I would wager my life on it. One loop ago, Ryan had theorized that Lightning Butt's body was made of an anomalous metal. It was the only explanation for why Frank the Mad's ability to absorb these alloys had seemed to affect the Invincible Warlord. But doubt always remained, because how could an invincible metal make one immune to frozen time? Now, it suddenly made more sense. Augustus Power gave his body the properties of a metal from the orange world, the source of all inorganic material. A world made only of matter, without energy, without life. Death does not exist in the purple world. A world without time. Adamantin, Ryan whispered. Shroud looked down on him from his vantage point. Adamantin? Hello, mythical material from Greek mythology, said to be harder than anything? Did nobody read the classics? Ryan shrugged. It's as good a name as any. The courier stopped time by causing the purple world and Earth's dimension to align, creating an anomaly where he alone could affect causality. But that substance, the adamantin, didn't come from either reality. It was an unnatural metal from a higher realm where things like death, time, or the laws of physics held no sway. From its location in the cube, it might even be the UR metal, the ultimate substance that all lesser ores derived from. No wonder it behaved in such an anomalous way. So. Augustus might be an orange, Sunshine whispered to himself. I always wondered why Julie couldn't. Julie Costa? Ryan asked. She could alter life with a touch, Mr. Wave answered, his voice more somber than usual. Create new life, or give people cancer. Pretty nasty power, but one that could have saved many. I thought Augustus slew her before she could make contact with him, Sunshine said, but it may be that Julie's power simply didn't register him as alive in the first place. But how do you explain his aging and tumor then? Shroud asked, having clearly done his research. We know he doesn't eat or breathe. If he is made of metal, how can he age? Stone degrades and iron rusts, Sunshine pointed out. And if he had a latent cancer before he gained his power, the tumor might have gained his invulnerability too. I think his power only gave his body the properties of that alien metal, Ryan theorized. Lightning but may not eat or breathe, but I know for a fact that he sleeps, creepily so. There are still chemical processes taking place inside him, they're just no longer biological in nature. It could be that Lightning Butt's body reacted negatively to the laws of physics themselves, causing a slow, almost imperceptible degradation. It could resist atomic explosions, but not reality itself trying to reject a foreign element. It wasn't a perfect defense either. Frank could affect Augustus, as did Livia's time-skipping. Other conceptual abilities might bypass the invulnerable nature of this metal. If so, then Frank the Mad might be the only person capable of harming Augustus, Shroud said, or whatever ability you use to defeat Geist. Over here, Len shouted from the other end of the bridge, interrupting the discussion. Look. Ryan's group rejoined their allies, making their way into the next room in a tight formation. The next area had a source of light, namely red crystals embedded in the ceiling. This laboratory was far smaller than the metal sphere outside, but large enough to house workstations, biomechanical servers, and heart-shaped vats full of swirling liquid. Alien orange crystal growths had started taking over the ceiling like an infection, while piles of wonder boxes lined up the southern wall. A large hole led into a dark corridor beyond the room, with the remains of a shattered blue gate laying in the middle of the room. Forgetting all caution, Saren immediately moved to investigate the boxes. I've never seen so many elixirs at once. The psycho whistled as she opened a wonder box, revealing seven bottles inside, one for each elixir color except black. It's a full war chest. Ryan paid more attention to the strange vats, finding seven of them north of the laboratory. Each contained gallons of elixir, one for each of the seven standard colors. Computers, human computers, were linked to the devices by nerve-like cables. It appeared someone had connected Earth technology to alien devices with biomechanical technology. All of them joined up in a central computer, equipped with large control panels and a comfy chair. Though energy still flowed into the machine, the screens had gone dark. Can you access the database? Sunshine asked Shroud, 
as they immediately moved to secure the vats. The young game designer approached the computer and reactivated it, but quickly shook his head in denial. Only a white spot to write numbers and letters had appeared on the screen. It's password protected, and that machine is clearly genius tech of some kind. It might take me a while to figure out a way to extract the info with. The calmly put a paw on the glass man, gently moved him aside, and took the seat for his own. How the chair managed not to crumble beneath a 700 kilos bear of mass destruction, Ryan would never understand, but it survived. The typed three passwords in a row on the computer, before the screen let out a melodious ding sound and revealed a hundred files. How did you do that? Shroud asked in shock, as Len joined the to examine the computer's data. I, uh, I studied profiling, psychology, and behavioral sciences, the explained sheepishly. I made a psyche profile of the alchemist based on compiled secondhand information, tried to figure out the likely passwords, and one of them clicked. What was the password? Ryan asked lazily as he approached the vats, observing the blue elixir through the membrane separating it from the outside world. To his surprise, the slime created a tentacle and waved at the human. World Domination 666 Homo Novus 6 Magnum Opus The replied, before explaining his guess. 6 is a perfect numerical number and a better bet than 7, the exclamation point reinforces security, and since the alchemist likened herself to a god creating perfection, I figured, homo novus and, magnum opus were put somewhere. Everybody loves Latin. Nice guess, nerd, Saren replied, unimpressed. She kept searching through the wonder boxes like a child through Christmas presents. Anything interesting? It's all encrypted, but I can figure it out. The said happily. Once you remove the safeties, could you transfer data to my suit's computer? Len asked the man bear. This, this may contain all the information we need to understand elixirs. This room, this room might very well be their birthplace. Leo Hargraves crossed his shining arms, before glancing at Mr. Wave. The laser genome had moved in front of the demolished door leading into the next part of the complex. Do you see anything? It's quiet, Mr. Wave replied as he peeked through the blasted hole in the walls. The corridor beyond had no lamp to light it, leaving only an abyss of darkness. Too quiet. Keep an eye open, Hargrave said warily. This place is too precious to be left undefended, and yet nobody intercepted us. Something happened here, something terrible. I agree, Ryan said, touching the vat. The elixir swirled in its container in response. I suppose you won't tell us what happened? The answer came in French, of all languages. Are you a homo sapiens? The voice echoed in Ryan's head, between his ears, and inside his neurons. The courier flinched, while the elixir grew agitated inside its vat. Are you a homo sapiens? The alien voice repeated. It was neither male nor female, more like a robot trying to imitate words it didn't fully know how to vocalize. Ryan glanced at his group, but none seemed to have heard the elixir. As he guessed, the creature used telepathy. I have the pleasure of being one, yes, the courier replied in the French tongue while he focused back on the blue elixir. The answer came swiftly, and with a very different tone. I'm so happy. The elixir let out a psychic sound that could pass for a squeal of joy, and its voice turned cheerful. Do you want to bond with me? Even though the voice sounded like nothing human, the tone reminded Ryan of an overactive child. Uh, maybe later, the courier replied, taken aback. He sensed his comrade's gazes on his back. What happened to the door? It fell down, the blue elixir replied, before instantly returning to the subject that truly mattered. Can we bond now? Has later become now? That concept of time is so weird. No, it hasn't. Ryan replied. Can you tell me what happened? Look, I really, truly, deeply want to bond with you. Can we bond now? I'm, no. Ryan said, finding the creature's insistence oppressive. No. Why don't you want to bond with me? The elixir whined, annoyed and disappointed. Don't you want to be happy? Riri, what is it? Shorty asked. Who are you talking to? Why in French? 
Somehow that was the part that bothered Shroud the most. Ignore him, Saren said, not even paying attention to the scene. It's better for everyone. All I want is to have a passionate bonding session with you, the blue elixir continued to court Ryan, not taking no for an answer. The courier was tempted to call it nice guy. I want to be with you. I want to be inside you, to know everything about you. I want to fill all your cells and molecules, until we become one. It will be great. I will learn everything about you, know you, love you. I will always be there with you, for you. The wording sent shivers down Ryan's spine. You can't force someone to bond. The courier protested, and this time half his team looked at him as if he had lost his mind. Or at least even more so. You need consent. But all you have to do is let me out, so I can slip inside you. I'm sorry, but... I am already in a committed relationship with my violet elixir. The blue elixir didn't answer instantly, and when it did, its tone had suddenly turned into something far less friendly. It only wants you for yourselves, it said. Ryan sighed, and he suddenly realized that elixirs being unable to talk might have been the alchemist's intended feature, rather than a bug. It only wants you for your body. It doesn't appreciate you like I do. It doesn't know what you like. It can't make you happy, but I will make you better. I will make you super duper smart, or warn you of all dangers, anything you need to be happy. I'm sorry, nice guy, but I am elixir monogamous. Wait, did Ryan getting a black power count as cheating on his violet elixir with Darkling? The courier never considered it that way, but now he felt slightly guilty. We can share. The blue elixir tried to haggle. If there's not more than one, I'm sure we could share. Even if your elixir doesn't understand what you need, I'm sure I can teach it. I can fix you. Alright, this had gone on long enough. Look, I'm not interested but I know people who might be, Ryan said, trying to distract the creature. There is a girl called Sarah, who I'm sure you'll get along with. Or Simon. Oh. The blue elixir calmed itself. Are they homo sapiens too? Yes. The blue elixir let out a happy squeal. When can I bond with either of them? It asked. Can I bond with them now? Ryan glanced at his comrades, their embarrassed silence music to his ears. His eyes then wandered to the psycho in the room. What? The lovely Saren asked. Don't look at me like that, you double-timer, Ryan replied in his native tongue, before glancing back at the other captive elixirs. Since one of them could talk but not tell Homo sapiens apart, the courier wondered if they were in the process of being conditioned. On a second thought, I don't even want to know, the psycho replied, grabbing a wonder box for herself. Are we done yet? Almost, Len said, trying to find a spot to link the computer to her suit. Shush, Mr. Wave is hearing something, the genome said, his body shining with bright red light. Mr. Wave knew he couldn't pass unnoticed. Indeed, Ryan's suit picked up sounds approaching from the corridor. A thump, then another. Footsteps. The elixirs suddenly started to get agitated, and Ryan sensed something familiar through their psychic link. An emotion as old as life and time. Fear. It's them. A green visor appeared in the darkness of the corridor, followed by an alien gargle. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 113, Final Contact First contact started with a fight, but to mankind's credit, the aliens shot first. Ryan barely had the time to activate his power and push Len and the down, as the mysterious intruder fired a crimson ray into the room. When time resumed, the laser had vaporized the computer's chair and blown a molten hole in a metal wall. Mr. Wave, who could move at light speed, sidestepped to dodge the attack, while Saren and Sunshine were immediately on high alert. Shroud turned invisible, as he usually did. The creature quickly stepped into the laboratory, in all its inhuman glory. The horror was a biomechanical, humanoid abomination three meters tall, its entire body covered in crimson-orange metal armor. A strange, black biological growth taking the shape of an organic cannon covered the right arm, while the left arm's humanoid hand had claws as sharp as knives. The armor showcased reptilian green eyes on the shoulders and the chest, 
while acid drooled down a fanged mouth where the stomach should have been. A cyclopean gaze peered through a green visor and a crimson helmet. Ryan decided to call it E.T. Well, I guess we're too late for the boiled eggs, the courier said as he rose back to his feet alongside his teammates. We're skipping straight to the omelette. Sifu, what is this thing, the asked in horror, though to his credit the young pandawan had already adopted a fighting pose. It's them. Nice guy answered from inside its tank, though only Ryan understood it. They're back. They're back. Who cares, Saren said, energy building up in her gauntlets. It struck first. The alien answered with a gargling, inhuman roar. Mr. Wave guesses you will join all his dead enemies, the boastful genome said, his body flaring red. Deep down the extinct species list. Mr. Wave turned into a laser to smash into Edie head on. However, the creature teleported in a flash of purple light before the carnival member could hit it. Mr. Wave continued his course into the next room, while E.T. reappeared in the middle of the laboratory. Saren raised her gauntlets, but Sunshine interrupted her before it could strike. Careful, you might hit the elixir's containers, he warned. If any drop hits one of us. To her credit, Saren didn't open fire, and tried to position herself to avoid both damaging the facility and harming her teammate. Sunshine followed her lead, while the Enlen attempted to engage E.T. in melee. Finding the area too crowded for his usual acrobatics, Ryan attempted to encircle the creature from the side. E.T.'s body flared with an orange glow, and both the panda's claws and Len's mechanical fists phased harmlessly through the creature. Yet when the monster's left hand reached for the panda's throat, it turned solid. The claws sank into the man-bear's flesh like butter, lifted him above the ground, and tossed him at Len. Shorty caught the panda on, but both were tossed back. To Ryan's horror, Shorty's back impacted on Nice Guy's biomechanical container, but to his relief, the machine was much more solid than it looked. The vat stood firm, not even showing a crack. While the quickly shifted between his bear and human form to heal his wound, the alien's multiple eyes then started projecting a blue light that reminded Ryan of a sci-fi scanner. Each of the eyes analyzed a single member of the group, but E.T.'s visor snapped in the courier's direction when his turn came. The courier immediately recognized the emotion within the alien's cyclopean gaze. Fear. Before you ask, I don't have a phone, Ryan replied, and the disappointed E.T. responded by turning red and charged at him. Though far larger than the time traveler, the alien moved at a speed almost too fast for the eye to follow. Ryan barely had the time to activate his time stop before the monster's left claw reached out for his head. And they kept going. Ryan watched on as the claws slowly moved closer to him inch by inch, so slow the movement was almost imperceptible. The alien's ocular organs glanced around them in slow motion, keeping an eye on the thin cracks that Ryan's black flux particles ripped into the fabric of space-time. Damn it, could everyone move inside Ryan's private time now? He should charge them for the privilege. Though thankfully the alien couldn't move very fast, unlike lightning but. Ryan pivoted on the creature's flank, aimed in the direction opposite to the elixir's vats, and activated his armor's chest weapon at point-blank range. A gravity projectile rushed at E.T. when time resumed, hitting it in the chest. Ryan had seen that device blow a hole in Mekron's bunker, but it failed to even damage the alien's biomechanical suit. It only pushed E.T. back a few meters into one of the lab's corners, the monster's armored feet anchoring themselves into the metal ground. My homo sapiens will kick your pseudopod. Nice guy shouted through the telepathic link. The mythe part made Ryan shudder, but he focused on the fight ahead. Right between the globules. Shroud chose this moment to reveal himself, flying right above the alien. Using his glass armor's extra mass, the vigilante manifested thick bindings keeping the surprised E.T. restrained. Now, he shouted. Now their line of fire was clear, both Saren and Sunshine struck right as Shroud retreated. The cornered E.T. took a blast of solar plasma and a powerful shockwave to the face. Or it should have, if it hadn't manifested a white, rounded energy field right before the impact. The protection took the appearance of a small sphere around the alien's armor, and cancelled the attacks the moment they hit it. Solar flares and red shockwaves were instantly cancelled, while Shroud's glass restraints turned to harmless glass dust. 
white flux. The creature could use a variant of Cancel's power. Ryan almost activated his power, but decided against it. If that shield allowed the monster to move at normal speed inside his time anomaly, then it would massacre his allies. At least E.T. had stopped moving while it kept the shield up, its multiple eyes glancing in all directions. I can't feel my glass inside that shield. Shroud shouted as Len and the joined him, the group surrounding the alien from all sides. White Genome Leo shouted, while Mr. Wave returned to the laboratory, ready for round two. Neither Sunshine nor Saren had interrupted their barrage though, keeping the creature pinned to its corner. Perhaps they hoped to short-circuit the shield too. Don't enter its range. It's not a host. Nice guy protested. Though nobody but Ryan could understand what the trapped elixir said, it could clearly hear what the group said. It stole our energies and bottled them up. So it has a limited supply? Ryan guessed, preparing to open fire with his gravity gun. The creature exhausted flux the way a car used oil, which meant it could run out of juice. Keep going. The courier opened fire with his chest weapon, while Len did the same with a jet of pressurized water. Neither projectiles used powers to work, so they bypassed the white flux shield. However, E.T. responded by collapsing its white shield and teleporting away before any attack could connect. Above. Shroudy shouted out a warning, as the monster reappeared above their heads. Its feet cling to the ceiling like Spider-Man. The alien raised its organic, right-hand cannon. The weapon shifted to reveal a dozen mouths on all sides, each spitting out a spiked, green seed. The group dispersed in all directions to avoid the barrage, even the living sun. He was wise enough not to take an unnecessary risk, and right to do so. When the projectiles hit the ground, their spikes immediately expanded into fanged roots capable of shredding through the steel. One landed among the wonder boxes, and to Ryan's horror, it seemed to gorge itself on the elixirs. That particular seed started to grow unnaturally large at a nightmarish speed, forcing Leo to immediately incinerate the plant before it could overtake the room. E.T. continued its onslaught, forcing the group to disperse. Much like he saved Ryan during his first loops, Mr. Wave used his astonishing speed to move the slower members of the group to safety. Ryan and Shroud both took flight and attempted to hit the alien from both sides. The creature responded by teleporting again, this time walking on the surface of Nice Guy's vat. Edie must have noticed the group's unwillingness to damage the room's equipment, and now using its position as a defense while it continued its bombardment. The alien's chest mouth gargled, and Ryan realized the creature was talking. What does it say? Saren asked, repelling a seed by creating a weak shockwave around her entire body. I think, the squealed as he barely managed to dodge an organic projectile, his power allowing him to grab the basics of the alien's language. I think it said, peace among the stars. Ah, so the, kill everyone who resists kind of peace. Wonderful. While Ryan's experience with the elixirs had taught him most extraterrestrial creatures were benign, the courier guessed they had just met one of the rotten apples. The courier charged with his armor, deciding to engage E.T. in close combat. In response, the alien stopped its onslaught, an orange hue spreading through its armor. When it receded, the suit had changed color. From the plates of crimson to the visor, all parts of the armor had turned into ivory. Into adamantine. The creature could change its armor's material on a molecular level, even into something indestructible. Yet in this case, that was a mistake. The alien arrogantly leaped on the ground, hand raised to engage Ryan in close combat. Its adamantine claws could tear the Saturn armor apart like butter. Don't. Mr. Wave warned, attempting to prevent a close encounter by ramming into E.T. himself. But the extraterrestrial thing didn't even register his presence, the living laser bouncing off its indestructible armor like a tennis ball on a wall. The alien charged at the courier with mechanical determination. When Ryan was within a few inches of the alien, he froze time and punched it in the helmet. E.T. didn't even attempt to dodge, as arrogantly confident in its invulnerability as lightning but. Its adamantine armor allowed it to move normally in the stop time, but its foe had centuries of experience under his belt. Ryan lowered his head to dodge E.T.'s claws, while his fist smashed the alien's visor. A crack spread on the ivory metal, 
and black particles slipped inside. The alien let out a burst of multicolored energy in the stop time, sending Ryan stumbling backward. The creature screeched when the clock resumed, scratching its helmet in panic. Nerd, what did you do? Saren snarled, creeped out by the scene. She unleashed a shockwave at E.T., but the attack had no more effect than a breeze against the creature's indestructible body. Ryan took a step back, as E.T.'s high-pitched screams only increased in intensity. Black lines appeared all over the armor's surface, revealing nearly invisible circuits surging with flux. The courier noticed streaks of white, red, blue, and all the other colors of the elixir rainbow. All of them were quickly turning black. Black's essence was paradox, a destabilizing influence, and the alien's armor seemed to use the core seven colors in tandem. A perfect union which Ryan had disrupted. I think I caused an oil spill, the courier admitted sheepishly. Edie let out an abominable scream as its eyes all turned black, and a sphere of darkness appeared inside its maw. Gravity collapsed around it, cutting the monster in half and dragging both parts into the tiny black hole. The black flux devoured the alien from within. Riri, get do, Len rushed to her best friend's side, but her movements slowed down, her sentence left hanging. Though the world around Ryan hadn't turned purple, everything had frozen in place. Sunshine flames consumed the seeds without ever finishing the job, Shroud gave a hand to Mr. Wave, but their fingers never reached one another, Saren's gauntlets shone with red energy, while the panda's head peeked from behind the room's computer. Even the alien's body remained trapped between the two seconds, its body perpetually devoured by the black hole at its core. Tiny cracks in the fabric of space-time spread around it. Everything had stopped except for the elixirs, which still swirled inside their containers, and Ryan himself. The courier looked around himself, but his body neither produced violet nor black particles. No phantom of the past pursued him. This space-time anomaly was unrelated to his power, and it frightened him. Gee, did I accidentally break time? Ryan asked, before glancing at the trapped elixirs. He focused on the violet one. Any idea how to fix this? To his surprise, the violet elixir answered with a telepathic message of its own. Are you a homo sapiens? It asked, hopeful. Ryan sighed. No, I'm a platypus. Oh. I am sad. Apparently, though they could understand the human tongue, sarcasm was still beyond an elixir's power. The black does as it wills. Of course it did. Ryan approached the black hole, in case he could close it the same way he had once opened a gate to the black world. My friend. Though it echoed in Ryan's mind, the voice didn't belong to Nice Guy, or the Violet Elixir. The courier could have recognized it among any other. Ryan peeked into the black hole, a speck of darkness no bigger than a finger. It was no bottomless pit, but a door. A portal to a familiar place. Darkling? Ryan called out into the void. And it answered, with what could pass for psychic frustration. My name, is not Darkling. Yes it is, Ryan replied, though he let out a breath of relief. I'm glad to hear from you too, my alien minority friend. We have little time, the alien warned, going straight to business. When the black flux has finished consuming this creature's flux reserves, the door will collapse and time will resume. I cannot talk to you for long. Ryan let out a sigh of relief, thankful he wouldn't need to reload to put time back on track. How is it even possible, he asked. We needed a particle accelerator to open a portal last time. Space-time in this metal prison is, irregular. Thin. I believe it was meant to be, to open doors to the higher realms. And as it was often the case with would-be summoners, Eva Fabre had probably summoned something she couldn't put down. That would also explain why Ryan's black flux particles had such an easy time destabilizing the pocket dimension. I have observed this place from the black world, where time holds no sway. From this portal, I have seen the past, and the present. I watched, and I learned. Can you tell me what this place is? Ryan asked, glancing at the facility. Once there was an empire, in another universe, that established contact with the higher realms, Darkling struggled to find the words. Though it had spent quite a lot of time around Ryan, he still had trouble with human concepts. 
They learned to use flux to fuel their technology, before trying to enslave my kindred to ascend by force, after the ultimate ones brought them low, they fled here, to your universe. Remembering back a story, Ryan put the two and two together. The alchemist found this ship after it crashed, he muttered to himself. She used their technology to create genomes, so we could have a fighting chance, if these creatures went after us. Yes but, she was wrong. What do you mean? I have asked the Black Ultimate One for answers, the empire that built this ship collapsed many decades ago, overthrown by their slaves, nothing remains. Darkling marked a short pause, its words heavy. No invasion is coming, nor even a rescue. This ship is, all that is left. Ryan observed the armored warrior, the black hole slowly consuming its edges while leaving the courier unscathed. It's a Japanese holdout, the courier whispered. They're still fighting a war they lost long ago. What is a... Japanese? A husbando, or a waifu? Darkling didn't answer immediately. Whatever, an ember can still spark a fire if left unchecked, this alchemist had the opportunity to destroy this place once and for all, as you plan to do with the machine's base in that city of yours. But she didn't. Eva Fabre tried to give human superpowers instead, to fight against whatever extraterrestrial entity might reach Earth. But if Darkling was correct, then she had been crusading against windmills. Universal Master Race Eva Fabra had learned of these aliens' history, but instead of taking it as the cautionary tale that it was, she repeated their mistakes all over again. She tried to make mankind this extraterrestrial successors, to give humans the power to conquer the cosmos. And instead of Superman, she had created the likes of Mekron, Bloodstream, and Augustus. Or maybe she just didn't care. She had to have known about the psycho condition before releasing the elixirs in the wild. She could not resist the lure of its power, she summoned creatures from the higher realms, tried to harvest the technology of the slumbering soldiers. But something went wrong. Test subjects escaped, and she lost control of that facility. She has retreated deep into the ship, if the last soldiers escape this place, they will bring great destruction to your civilization, they can replicate even the most powerful of your powers. All of them, but the black. Ryan shivered, as he realized that the creature they fought hadn't been a boss. It had been a grunt. They are vengeful ghosts. They must rest. But if the ultimate ones brought that empire low, why don't they finish the job? Ryan asked. The Violet One knew about this place, since it sent me visions. Why doesn't it take direct action? It did, Darkling pointed out. It sent you. Ryan froze, as everything suddenly fell into place. The Violet Ultimate One had sent the courier visions, and used messages to guide him into transporting minds across time. The interdimensional entity never intervened directly, but it gave hints, or what could pass as such for a transdimensional entity. All to nudge Ryan into being at the right place at the right time. I understand now, the courier said, frowning behind his helmet. It sent me this vision, so I may make my own decision. A human sparked this disaster, and a human must end it. Yes, you can bring down this place, now and across all timelines. The decision of what to do, is all yours. In the end, this ship was no different from a Mechron base. How do I destroy it? Ryan asked, entirely serious. This ship has a control center, a mind, find it. I believe a way might reveal itself then. Darkling let out a strange feeling through the telepathic bond, which Ryan took for an attempt at reassurance. We elixirs communicate with each other using flux, you spent so long bound to your messenger, and made contact with the ultimate ones. Ryan turned his head at the captive elixirs. All of them had grown quiet, perhaps eavesdropping on the discussion. So I picked up the language? Yes, out of all humans on this earth, you alone are closest to ascension. Direct communication with you is, difficult, but possible. In time others will learn too, this will make you compatible with the technology, but she might fight back. Might? More like will, from what Ryan had seen so far. The alchemist wouldn't let that treasure trove of technology go. Unfortunately, time was running out. The courier already noticed movement returning at the edge of his vision, more parts of the armor being absorbed into the portal. 
Thanks, my friend. Good luck, Darkling said, the hole collapsing on itself. I wish. I could help more. You already did more than enough. Ryan expected a bright explosion, but the space-time anomaly ended with a whimper instead. The alien's entire being collapsed into the dark hole, which dissipated right as time fully resumed. Own. Len finished her sentence, but her hand froze in midair before it could touch Ryan's shoulder. Of the alien warrior, not even dust remained. After a short silence and no further attack, the genomes regrouped. Sunshine had finished incinerating the seeds, and though the wonder boxes and walls had taken heavy damage, most of the facility remained intact. Is it gone? Shroud asked, floating above the spot where the alien used to stand. Or did it teleport away? It's gone, Ryan replied, glancing at the corridor leading to the next room. And I know what to do. His teammates must have noticed his serious tone, before Shroud looked at him warily. Go on, he asked. You played Metroid, Ryan reminded his friend. If so, then you should know it can only end up one way. With one big explosion. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 114, Chemical Reaction Weeds had overtaken the ship like an abandoned garden. As Ryan's group advanced into the metal bowels of the alchemist's base, they ran into more and more alien plant life. Greenish slime leaked from the walls, while snake-like red roots and fanged purple flowers dug holes into the floor. Eventually, the corridors became so overwhelmed by vegetation that sunshine moved at the front to torch a path ahead. Often, they would find the broken remains of armored aliens, their helmets melted by lasers, their shielding pierced by powerful rounded projectiles. Yet they never found any trace of what killed them. Their slayers didn't leave corpses behind when they died. So if I follow correctly, Shroud said, after Ryan had finished briefing his team. This is an alien spaceship from a long-lost imperialistic civilization, and the creature we fought was one of its soldiers. The alchemist pillaged their technology, but accidentally woke up the remaining troops left in stasis and now they're fighting her for control of the facility. And an alien deity gave you a divine mandate to destroy this place before the prisoners can escape. Pretty much, yeah, Ryan replied, while Len checked out the data that had harvested from the alchemist's computers. The man-bear himself advanced on all fours, an ear against the walls. Mr. See-Through snickered, unconvinced. Should I call you Joan of Arc? You did hear voices. God loves the reptilians too, Ryan preached, so long as they stay in Reptiland. Why? Unlike Shroudy Matty, who remained in denial, Saren had listened to the explanations with solemn silence. Why? Why did Eva Fabre make genomes and psychos possible? I guess. I guess she wanted to protect us, the suggested, trying to be charitable. To give us powers, so we could defend ourselves? What good could have come from empowering people like Mekron and Augustus? Leo Hargraves asked at the front, skeptical. The former alone killed more people than both world wars combined. Though Mr. Wave is thankful that she graced the universe with the brilliance of Mr. Wave. The boastful genome paused briefly. Mr. Wave didn't find a way to avoid the repetition. Still, he agrees with the rising sun. The walk doesn't match the talk. The aliens aren't coming either. Ryan shrugged, as his armor picked up vibrations. Well, except those inside this place. And how do you figure we destroy this ship in the first place? Shroud kept nagging him. I thought we might have a last-minute desperate escape, with a digital countdown. Maybe a round number. I would rather avoid that, Shroud replied dryly, arms crossed. Besides our own lives, if elixirs are truly sapient, helpful beings, then blowing up the ship would kill them too. Human life isn't the only kind with value, Sunshine agreed, having now destroyed the plant growth with his shining light. I agree we cannot let the horrors of this ship escape into the wider world, quick save, but blowing it up should be a last resort. Truth be told, Ryan kinda hoped that reaching the ship's control center would provide an alternative solution too. Nice guy might have been grating, but Shroud was correct that it deserved to live. However, the courier suspected his mere presence might cause the ship to collapse anyway. 
Ryan's black power was a paradox, destabilizing reality with its very existence. The courier guessed that Earth's dimension was solid enough to absorb the damage, but the spaceship's thin place was a small, artificial construct. Ryan degraded it a little further with each time stop. Eventually, it might even collapse on itself. Had the Violet Ultimate One foreseen this possibility? That Illuminati creature could control all of space and time, if Darkling was to be believed. It might very well be omniscient. The raised a paw. Sifu, I'm hearing something through the metal. My armor is picking up vibrations too, Ryan said, analyzing the readings. Where do they come from, my young Pandawan? The left, his sidekick replied, using his sensitive bare ears to pick up sound. Explosions. They must be pretty powerful for their noise to go through the ship's shielding, Leo Hargrave said. Considering the increasing number of corpses, we must be approaching the site of a battle. Can you offer more details? Aye aye, I will try. The took a deep breath, intimidated by sunshine. I hear. I hear something big and heavy moving, and impacts. From the form of the ship, and the way we moved inside so far, the left should lead us to the front, Shroud pointed out. If the architecture is anything like Earth's aircrafts, then it should be where the command center is located, Leo Hargraves guessed with a nod. Timmy, can you bring us as close to the sound source as possible? Yes, sir, the raised a paw to his forehead in a military salute. Of course, sir. The rest of you, stay on guard, Sunshine said. Neither side of this war is an ally. And so they took the lead, an ear against the ground. As they took twists and turns, Ryan's armor picked up more and more vibrations and other flux energy activities. The very fabric of reality seemed to weaken the further they progressed. Riri, I finished analyzing the data, Len said, as the group left the cramped corridor for the remains of a large hangar the size of an airport. The metal walls had been melted away, and Ryan could see the scrapped remains of robots and vehicles everywhere he looked. Clearly, a battle had taken place here. It's, it's all we need. Saren's head snapped in her direction. For me? You could make a cure? Yes, Len replied, before hesitating and avoiding Miss Chernobyl's gaze. She wouldn't like what came next. The psycho in the group clenched her fists. Go on, Nemo. Don't sugarcoat it. The alchemist, Len took a long deep breath. The alchemist already has a cure. Had it from the start. Saren abruptly froze in place, causing Shroud to bump into her back. Repeat that, the psycho said. But now her armored gauntlets had clenched so tightly, that Ryan worried she might break them. It's, uh, Saren's heavy gaze troubled Len. I should start at the beginning. If I understand the data collected. Elixirs come from the white world, but can naturally move from one colored dimension to another and immediately adapt to their new home's flux energy. And they use this flux to communicate? Shroud asked, trying to understand. Yes, Shorty confirmed with a nod. The alchemist decoded the elixir's language with the alien's technology, and with it, she can, how to say that. Educate them. Tell them how to recognize DNA, which species to bond with. If we associate gene therapy with the right flux message. We teach the elixirs to patch out the bugs, Ryan finished. It could, it could even work for you, Len explained to Saren. Or Frank. It's all about the right signal. Ryan had expected Miss Gasshole to be overjoyed. After all, she had spent a decade and a half as a cloud trapped in a suit. The possibility of becoming human again was a dream come true, and her previous self had been willing to consider murdering Ryan when she thought he wouldn't deliver. However, Saren had picked up on a worrying detail and wouldn't let it go. She had a cure, she said, her voice low and furious. That bitch had a cure all along, but didn't release it? Psychos weren't a bug, but a feature. Even Mr. Wave had turned serious. Why would she do that? Why would anyone do that? I... I cannot say, Len replied. All psychos are sterile due to their unstable genetic code, so, so they can't replace mankind the way genomes will. But what about the children of two genomes? 
Leo Hargraves asked at the front. I only know a few who were born after one or both parents consumed an elixir, Narcinia included. If a genome was above 15 years of age, they could only have earned their power from an elixir. Even Fortuna and Felix had taken elixirs, unlike their adoptive sister. If the creation of psychos was intentional, do children of genomes risk mutating too? Sunshine asked, clearly worried for innocent lives. I've seen a few genome children in my life, and all of them turned out fine, Ryan said. Also, in cases of one parent having powers and the other not, the child inherited a variant of the parent's abilities. I couldn't really figure out why exactly though. It's because elixirs use asexual reproduction, Riri, Len said. Like jellyfish. But they can also alter their doubles makeup during the duplication. Ryan blinked behind his helmet, as the truth dawned on him. Wait, so if I had a child with a normie, my elixir would duplicate and pass on to the kid? To his horror, Len confirmed the theory with a nod. If one parent is a genome and the other is not, the elixir duplicates, fuses with the fetus, and slightly adapts the power to the new host. The thought of Ryan's children inheriting his power chilled him to the bone, and made him thankful that he had taken precautions against having a descendants. His power in itself was both a blessing and a curse, but in the hands of a child. It would make for nightmarish teenage years. If the parents are both genomes, Len cleared her throat. If both parents are genomes, the elixirs communicate during conception to avoid the pitfalls of the psycho condition. Instead of competing for a host, only one of the elixirs duplicates, but takes some information from the other. Since the child doesn't yet have dreams and desires yet, the child's elixir creates a power based on the two parents. So, to take Narcinia's example, Leo Hargraves asked, she was born a green genome, but with her power also being influenced by her father's yellow ability? Her mother could alter life, and her father could cut through anything, Shroud said. She can create life by cutting herself. Definitively green, but with some yellow inspiration. And since the children of genomes were always stable genomes, no matter the parents' nature, their numbers would only increase with time. Homo novice would phase out Homo sapiens, the way they did with the Neanderthals. Then what if, Shroud crossed his arms. And this is terrible to say it, but what if psychos were meant to kill as many normal people as possible? If the alchemist's plan is to make genomes supplant normal humans. Psychos by nature target other genomes first, Maddie, Ryan reminded him. And the random nature of powers meant creatures with world-ending powers like Bloodstream could arise. It can't be the only goal. While they had been arguing, they had reached the northwestern corner of the hangar. Sifu, we're close. He raised a paw at the wall. I can hear the source in this direction. Mmm, we might have to take a detour, Leo Hargrave said, not finding any door. Mr. Wave, could you quickly tour the room Anne? Saren furiously raised a fist at the wall, and unleashed a fearsome shockwave at it. The black steel, brittle and weakened, cracked and collapsed before Miss Chernobyl's onslaught. A terrible noise echoed through the hangar, followed by a cloud of green and dark dust as the attack revealed a path into a new, gigantic corridor. The courier heard the sound of lasers, explosions, and most importantly, voices coming from it. I forgot to explain rule number four. Ryan glared at Saren, hands on his waist. Avoid making too much noise. Too late, nerd, the furious psycho replied before stepping through the hole, her hands shaking in anger. Now she didn't want answers, but revenge. When I find her there will be blood, and it won't be my own. Ryan didn't have the heart to deny her wish, the rest of the group cautiously following her. The courier closed the march with Len. Shorty, would that cure work on you know who? Shorty looked down at the metal floor. Past a certain point, if a psycho couldn't stabilize their genetic code, the damage becomes so extensive that not even elixirs can correct it. She, she breathed long and deep. The alchemist has, she has others in storage. Other bloodstreams. Psychos who had degraded to the point they had become an entirely different form of life. The more he learned about this place, the more Ryan was convinced it had to go by whatever means necessary. The group followed the noise of battles all the way to a spotless, well-lit chamber deeper into the complex. 
All blast doors on the way had been torn apart, and Ryan had to leap over the wreckage. The next room was a fortified security checkpoint, with more than two dozen troopers in futuristic, sleek blue bodysuits firing at a giant monster over improvised barricades of scrapped metal. Behind them stood a damaged blue gate 9 meters in height, which unlike the rest of the facility looked relatively intact. Some of the defenders wore helmets, others did not, but they all shared the same facial features. Short black hair, blue eyes, plain features, and a determined expression. Their weapons included rifles unleashing familiar red lasers, organic cannons identical to the ones used by E.T, and stranger devices looking like purple rods. On the other side of the chamber, closer to Ryan's team, an orange portal had opened in the very fabric of space, letting a colossal creature step halfway through. The entity reminded Ryan of a concrete cube more than 8 meters in diameter, except with six tiny golden legs to carry it. Lasers inflicted no damage to the creature, and it smashed one of the barricades with a leg. The blow sent scraps and troopers flying, the soldiers collapsing into blue particles when they hit the gate behind them. The survivors with rods used them to unleash violet projectiles tearing space apart. Ryan identified these weapons as focused violet flux, and unlike his black particles, reality absorbed the damage they caused after a while. When they hit the concrete creature though, the projectiles tore through its body as if it were made of clay. The barrage pushed the creature through the portal and it vanished into the orange flux rift, at least for now. With the threat dealt with for now, the troops peeked over the improvised fortifications to observe the newcomers. Ryan's group moved between the barricade and the portal, careful not to be close to any of them. Eva Fabre, I suppose, the courier asked. You have a lot of twins. You are clones, Len whispered. Quantum duplicates, a trooper said. Since the doubles collapsed into blue flux, Ryan guessed that the alchemist's power followed the same rules as Livia's. She created simulations indistinguishable from the real thing. Quick save, another Eva Fabre said, recognizing Ryan. Living Sunday. The time traveler bristled, as his team took a fighting formation. Len and Ryan stayed at the back, the sunshine, and shroud in the middle, and a furious Saren at the front with Mr. Wave. You know us? Leo Hargraves asked, while keeping an eye on the portal as if expecting the creature to crawl out of it again. We have been watching you for a while, ever since you defeated Case BIH-006 in Sarajevo, a trooper replied. BIH. Bosnia-Herzegovina. They were talking about Mekran. Your power is of the highest interest to us, another said, looking at Ryan. Your time anomaly's ability to affect our entire reality was deemed a milestone in our chronotech research. We made plans to safeguard your genetic data for future storekeeping, but other projects demanded our full attention. We saw you on security cameras, but the situation here is critical. We would be happy to discuss that, after reasserting direct control, a clone finished. Will you help us? Hell no. Saren took a heavy step forward. Why? The Eva clones all raised an eyebrow at the same time, some exchanging glances. Why should you help us? One of them asked. This facility is under attack by hostile extraterrestrial entities, that must be eradicated for the sake of the human RA. Why the fuck? Saren snarled, hands raised at the doubles. Why the fuck did you turn me into this? Who is she again? One Eva Fabre asked her doubles. One of the mutants working with Case USA 3682, another trooper answered. Codename Adam the Ogre. Oh yes, I remember. But I don't think we gave that one a case file. Don't think so either. Saren could clearly barely restrain herself from murdering them all where they stood. You don't even know my name. We didn't need to, and Eva shrugged, uncaring. We didn't force you to take two elixirs, if that is your question, another had the gall to say. If you experience discomfort, blame your greed. Saren raised her gauntlets to blast them, but Mr. Wave quickly moved in the way to stop her. Leo Hargraves still had questions, though his radiance had turned into a more scarlet shade of crimson than usual. His body language radiated restrained anger. Why make it possible to create psychos in the first place, the carnival leader asked, while Ryan observed the troopers. Something bothered him about them, 
but he couldn't explain why. Why all this sorrow? For mankind to take their rightful place as masters of the universe, one of the Evis answered calmly. As for psychos, if by that term you refer to bicolored mutants, we wish to understand how flux abilities from different colored dimensions would interact together, another clone added. We thought the potential synergies would greatly surpass monocolored powers, perhaps even lead to a genome capable of overriding reality itself. But we couldn't test the theory on a small sample of people. We needed something larger. We, we were were lab rats to you, the asked, his cute bear-like face morphing into a horrified expression. But you, you could have destroyed the world. She did, Mr. Wave replied, clearly not amused. And she left it for Mr. Wave to piece it back together. Do you think we are so careless? One Eva asked, completely oblivious to her own hypocrisy. The ecosystem damage was taken into account. We had enough genetic samples to clone a human sustainable population if the worst came to pass, and projects for Martian colonies. The chances of Earth's destruction were considered slim. Almost negligible. An acceptable loss, if the worst came to pass. Less drastic alternatives might have failed to establish a suitable Homo and novice population. Mass release guaranteed Homo sapiens decline within 200 years, according to our projections. You ruined this planet, you insane sociopath. Shroud snapped. You killed billions. The outburst didn't even phase them. Yes, a patient often experiences significant pain when a shock treatment is used, but in the end, what matters is that the cure works. Mankind's temporary discomfort will be quickly forgotten in the next age, when we establish colonies in the solar system and expand. You don't care about mankind, Saren snapped. You pay lip service to it, but deep down you don't give a shit. Energy built up in her gauntlets. You're just like Adam. We don't eat people, a clone replied, completely missing the point. Now, if you are done with your childish tantrum, we would be happy to teach you why this was necessary after we retake the facility. Do you, though he couldn't see her face beneath the armor, Ryan recognized the anger in Len's voice. She hadn't sounded this angry since she learned of how Dynamis turned Bloodstream into a product. You killed billions, ruined my father's life, all this despair and destruction. Do you feel any regret? The response was swift and chilling. No, all the Evis answered at once. No, of course not, one said, as if it had been a stupid question. Imagine a time when humans will reshape the very fabric of reality, like painters with a canvas? The universe is a dangerous place, continued another. A stress test was necessary to prepare mankind for the dangers ahead. And then came the coup de grace. We did what was necessary. One shrugged. It was a dirty job, but someone had to do it. One day, you will understand. Ryan had met many monsters and megalomaniacs in his life. Bombastic psychos, fanatical genome warlords, god wannabes. He thought he had heard it all. But that woman's voice, that complete, clinical disregard for human life, even big fat Adam and Augustus showed more emotion, even if it was cruelty. But the alchemist didn't feel even that. Eva Fabre had destroyed the world for the sake of a pipe dream, and gave absolutely zero fucks. You've seen what those lizards were up to, Ryan said, reaching a terrifying realization. I wondered why you never even considered that following in their footsteps was a terrible idea, but now I understand. Elixirs grant people their dearest wishes, and yours was to have an army of copies telling you how great you are. You turned this spaceship into an echo chamber. We considered that possibility and dismissed it, the Evas all answered at once. We all are simulations from different universes. But you're still somehow all Eva Fabre, Ryan pointed out. Don't you get it? You may have different experiences, but there are enough similarities that you still count as the same person. Enough that you can complete each other's sentences. If she truly created different simulations, then some would have protested against this horrifying course of action. But none of them did. Of course her power wouldn't summon copies that could oppose her, and whatever good intentions she might have had, years with only slavish clones for company had slowly eroded Eva Fabre's critical thinking. She was even more narcissistic than Augustus. I have heard enough. 
Sunshine floated above the ground, no longer a warm morning sun, but a vengeful fireball. Carnival, arrest this woman, he ordered. Shroud turned invisible, Mr. Wave cracked his knuckles and stepped out of Saren's way, while even the looked furious. Len herself prepared her water cannons, thoroughly done with words. Eva Fabre, you are under arrest for genocide, human experimentations, and crimes against humanity. If you surrender, you will be granted a fair trial before a citizen jury. Resistance will be met with lethal force. You want to arrest us? An Eva asked. The worst part, she sounded genuinely surprised. Years spent with only her clones for company had eroded all potential for self-reflection, to the point that she had expected the other genomes to fall in line on principle. We made you into gods. Then you shall be smote. Mr. Wave replied while turning into a laser, and charging straight at the barricades. The Evis answered with a volley of lasers, and Ryan froze time while his team prepared to charge. The courier looked up at the orange portal still fluctuating in the frozen time, and then at the giant gate behind the alchemists, as blue as the sea. Beyond this door was the starship's command center. He could feel it in his gut. Now? Now, he just had to fight his way inside. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 115, The Clone War The room erupted into chaos the moment time resumed. Red lasers and space-piercing bullets faced shockwaves, solar flares, streams of pressurized water, and a storm of glass. Yet it was a kung-fu-powered bear that made the most spectacular contribution, smashing through the alchemist clone's barricades right after Mr. Wave. The pulverized two clones while leaking blood from half a dozen lasers, transforming back and forth to regenerate, always staying on the move to avoid a fatal blow. Ryan himself did his part, punching any clone within his reach while quipping. However, the situation had become so confusing that he needed to freeze time to check up on his allies. Mr. Wave was busy poking the alchemist's clones to death, Shroud shielded his allies with reinforced glass barriers, while an enraged Saren fired shockwave after shockwave in a berserk rage. Yet no matter the group's ferocity, the alchemist's numbers only increased. One Eva Fabre clone duplicated by a factor of ten, and the new doppelgangers followed her example. Most appeared unarmed, or with, human, weapons such as rifles and guns. However, a few of the original doubles used strange gauntlet devices to teleport alien weapons to copy their copycats. Ryan figured that they used the same principle as Mars Power, accessing an armory in a separate pocket dimension. Which also meant that while the alchemist's power could replicate physical matter, flux-based tech remained beyond her reach. It made sense in a way. Eva Fabre was a blue genome, so how could she replicate the source of green or red powers? Ryan decided to focus on the clone suppliers first, but some of the new recruits materialized with suicide belts and attempted to blow themselves up in his face. The courier was forced to repel them using his armor's weapons. Unfortunately, this gave time for the clone army to organize. When they realized that Ryan was trying to make a beeline to the gate they were protecting, the suppliers among the doppelgangers distributed gauntlet devices to a regiment of new recruits. Two dozen Evis formed a barrier of bodies, their tools projecting a crimson shield. A beehive-like hexagonal barrier now protected the gates, one tough enough to resist Ryan's gravity gun. Guessing what Ryan had in mind, Mr. Wave attempted to assist, turning into a laser and smashing into the clone's defense. The crimson shield repelled him, so he tried again, and again, prodding the barrier from all angles, even jumping into the air to strike the defenders from above. Though the doppelgangers held the line, their shields often flickered on impact. Much like E.T.'s technology, their machinery ran on a limited supply of juice and would eventually run out. However, for once in Ryan's life, time wasn't on his side. Not only were the clones summoning more of themselves, they also organized better. Groups of energy shield users formed security barriers around the arsenal suppliers, allowing them to arm the reinforcements with minimal interference. Two groups of six laser users each trapped the in a pincer attack, and though the man-bear moved swifter than lightning, he couldn't outrun light. The doppelgangers gave him no breathing room and pushed him back against the orange world portal, slowly, but certainly. By now, the dead released so many blue flux particles that the whole room looked like a smuff party. 
Riri, behind you. Len shouted just as time resumed, the courier noticing two Evis raising a rifle with a two-meter wide barrel at him. He barely had the time to dodge to the side to avoid a green flux blast, which ended up turning the metal walls into wood upon impact. Oh, an eco-responsible weapon. Ryan said, as Len beheaded the clones with a stream of pressurized water. Shorty moved to cover him, while he engaged the nearest doubles in melee. I want one. If only they weren't trying to exterminate the last the Evis might have been true planeteers. His other allies didn't fare any better. Some clones could see Shroud even while he turned invisible, and forced him to stay on the defensive by raising glass barriers to stop projectile volleys. Saren's shockwaves overpowered shield users, but her power armor had cracks here and there. Only Leo Hargraves pushed the clones back rather than otherwise, bombarding them with blinding, fiery blasts. Saren's repeated shockwaves ended up structurally damaging the room, and a good fourth of the floor collapsed to reveal a black sea of alien machinery and energy cables below the metal panels. Sunshine raised an advancing wall of flames, trapping hundreds of Evis between his fire and the floor's hole. In response, a clone threw a round silver device at Leo Hargraves. The living sun quickly melted it in midair, but his action caused the device to unleash a six meters wide wave of immaculate energy. The white pulse destroyed any doppelganger it touched, and more worrying, instantly reverted sunshine to his human form. The carnival's leader fell down and would have died hitting the floor below, if Mr. Wave hadn't disengaged from his assault on the force shield to catch his ally in time. Shroud immediately raised barriers after barriers of glass to protect his teammates, but this only allowed the clones to surround the trio, their focused lasers slowly melting the defenses. Worse, the orange portal in the room flickered, and the same cubic monster from last time started crossing through, perhaps the chaos in the room had caught its attention. In any case, the was the closest to the rift when the creature stepped through, and it summarily kicked the bear out of the way. Clones tried to repel the orange world creature with a projectile volley, but only managed to halt its arrival. This was getting nowhere. The real one is not here. Ryan shouted through his armor's loudspeakers, pointing a hand at the gates. He had moved no more than a few meters away from it with judicious applications of his power, but the shield users still barred the way. She's behind these doors. He doubted that any of his teammates heard him except for Shorty, until Saren's voice echoed over the melee. Move out of the way, nerd. Ryan activated his armor's jetpack and flew away, as a mighty shockwave pulverized the clone regiment guarding the gates, short-circuiting their shields and vaporizing the wielders. However, the blast failed to affect the doors themselves, with no crack appearing on their blue surface. Still, it allowed the courier and Len to reach the gates. Then the firing stopped. Ryan peeked over his shoulder, watching as a crimson and orange shape emerged from the hole Saren made in the ground. A monstrous reptile in advanced power armor, whose very sight caused the unfazed Eva clones to freeze in terror. E.T.'s little brother had come, and brought its nephews. A dozen alien soldiers emerged from the holes gargling and roaring. Most were carbon copies of the creature Ryan's group defeated earlier, but one of them was twice the normal size, a horned horror with nine eyes and great draconic wings. A species instinct that never truly died awakened, as the humans in the room briefly stopped their battle to focus on the outside threat. The Eva clones pointed their weapons at the newcomers, while Sunshine managed to transform back into a fiery sun and bathed the alien vanguard with searing flames. The extraterrestrial creatures responded by teleporting around the room, tearing through Eva's doppelgangers with claws and beams. The winged alien instead chased after Sunshine, while an ET turned its armor into adamantin and attempted to tear the apart. Another soldier noticed Ryan and Len, but was forced to deal with a group of Evis before it could give pursuit. If one of these aliens had been a match for his entire team, a whole group of them would tear through any opposition. Ryan's group and the alchemist could resist for a while, maybe even win, but if more of these critters arrived. Well, Ryan was in no hurry to reload now. Mr. Wave, who had raced across the room to get the to safety behind Shroud's glass barrier, briefly stopped at Ryan and Len's side. Mr. Wave and Co. will hold them off, the genome said, as an alien soldier roared at them. Go get them, Tiger. You're sure? Len asked, worried. 
she understood that they would only buy minutes. Mr. Wave has never been happier. The living laser raised a thumb up. He can kill them more than once. Ryan didn't find any fault with that logic, and answered with a thumb up of his own. Mr. Wave immediately tackled the approaching alien soldier head-on, sending it flying backward, before reinforcing Saren. The lively psycho used shockwaves to push the concrete orange monster back through the rift. Can you hack through these gates? Ryan asked Shorty. Give me a minu, Len didn't finish her sentence, as the blue gate reacted the moment she touched it. It slid open in a blink, granting the duo entrance. The truce ended right there, as the remaining Evis attempted to stop Ryan from reaching the door with a volley of projectiles. But he froze time, grabbed Shorty, and moved into the next room while dodging lasers. The gates immediately closed behind him when time resumed, isolating them from the chaos outside, the courier could barely see a glimpse of sunshine engaging in an aerial duel with the alien dragon before the separation. The room Ryan and Len had walked into was clearly the starship's command center, and reminded the courier of Mekron's mainframe. A colossal biomechanical brain pulsated in the middle of a glass pillar, hooked to a dome of nerve-like cables by biomechanical circuits. The duo found the real Eva Fabre connected to the machinery. Though age had wrinkled her face and turned her black hair white, Ryan recognized her facial features. A human head was all she had left though. A hideous biomechanical body supported her skull, a grotesque parody of a human skeleton with elongated arms, life support systems, and artificial organs pulsating in an iron ribcage. Here asshole Prime stood, with her eyes closed. Cables linked her head to the glass tank and the giant brain within, much like how Alkimo's technology allowed him to experience captured mind's memories. Ryan noticed other strange tendrils hanging from the glass tank, probably to allow multiple people to connect to the machinery. She's, sleeping? Len asked, as the alchemist made no attempt to stop their approach. She remained in the thrall of a deep, peaceful slumber. Ryan guessed that the body modifications enhanced her control over the alien technology, much like Alchemo, she had cast out everything getting in the way of pure processing power. Eva Fabre had embedded herself into the starship's mainframe, like a tick on a cow's hide. Soaking herself in its technology, knowledge, and power, never interacting with the world outside except through the safety of a screen. She lived in a snow globe, sheltered from all consequences. Damn it, this is Monaco all over again, Ryan said. He wondered how much the technology had affected her, though. Ryan suspected that hooking oneself up to an imperialistic civilization's brain hadn't improved her sanity. Do we, Len pointed her weapons at the alchemist's head, hesitating. Eva Fabre's eyelids opened. The eyes were gone too, replaced with black cameras. They glanced at the two genomes, as soulless as anything else in this cold, artificial place. I dreamed too long, the alchemist said, her voice nothing more than a soft rattle. Her artificial organs flared with red light, a thin layer of crimson energy forming over her head and body. I dreamed of you invaders, stepping into my metal veins and spreading your rot. She moved her hand to grab Len, with Ryan responding by freezing time and shooting the H. Arc Geiger nightmare in the face with his chest weapon. But not only did the biomechanical monstrosity keep moving in the frozen time, but his gravity bullet also bounced off her black armor. Your time anomaly is powerful, quick save, but nothing unexpected. the alchemist froze while her metal fingers were within an inch of Shorty's head, for she had suddenly noticed the black particles and purple flux phantom next to Ryan himself. Black flux? Ryan exploited her confusion to end his time stop, allowing Shorty to realize the danger and back away. The alchemist's metal hand smashed the floor, striking with enough strength to cause a small quake. Guess you don't know everything about us, Ryan said, as he opened fire again, Shorty assisting him with torpedoes and pressurized water. No matter what you do, my progress will not be stopped. The alchemist glared at the duo, none of their attacks bypassing her energy shield. Why are you fighting me, my children? I created you, forged into gods. You should be fighting the aliens outside, not your maker. Shorty's response was short and to the point. You killed billions. What happens outside these walls means nothing, the alchemist replied, her eyes flaring blue. Immediately, 
A dozen Eva Fabre clones materialized around her, each carrying either a rifle or a submachine gun. With this ship, I can restart life anytime I wish. Only the data matters. The alchemist should have been at least 60 years old, and Ryan could tell time inside this pocket dimension behaved abnormally. Yet the clones looked no older than 30. All were humans, instead of a biomechanical horror like their master. Ryan quickly formed a theory. Eva Fabre's doubles remained the same, because she hadn't aged inside. Ryan and Len quickly dispersed as the clones opened fire, while the original remained immobile, her head still hooked to the central brain. The courier's armor sent alarm signals, as it noticed streams of foreign data invading the weapon systems. Damn, asshole Prime was trying to hack into his suit. So, you think you can improve the welfare of mankind by sacrificing the old one to make your new, improved version? Ryan asked, attempting to destroy the clones only to realize his chest weapon had stopped working. She clearly cared more about the idea of humanity than its actual people, that was for certain. Have you heard of human rights? I have seen other worlds beyond this dimension, the alchemist rasped haughtily. In one of them, the nations of the world were laid low by a flu. No disease will ever ravage genomes, nor will invaders from other worlds. You will not interfere with the march of progress. Who elected you? Ryan replied, freezing time for a second to smash some clones, then backing away to avoid a punch from the original. I was democratically chosen by the plushy majority, gave universal healthcare to my psycho followers, and fought bravely against the red tide threatening our way of life. What did you do? Governments are for those who cannot lead, the original Eva Fabre replied, summoning more reinforcements even while Len struggled to keep them at a manageable number. Half a dozen clones turned into twenty, and these started making copies too. Most humans live a short-sighted existence, caring for nothing more than their own personal comfort. They do not have the courage to make the necessary decisions. And who do you lead, clones of yourself? Ryan asked with a snort, rushing towards the biomechanical brain's tank. You've never led anyone in your life. You offered no guidance, raised no nation, inspired no follower. You wrecked the old world, and then you hid among the penguins instead of helping us get back on our feet. Hell, I'm sure you killed everyone at your old workplace when you couldn't convince them to join you. It was an elaborate guess based on what he had learned from Bacchus, but the abomination's eyes flared with annoyance. Ryan had struck a nerve. You did, he said. They couldn't understand, asshole Prime replied dismissively, while some of her clones nodded in agreement. Neither do you. Or else she wouldn't be trying to kill him in the first place. Eva Fabre didn't understand Ryan's true ability, nor of all the possibilities where the likes of Bloodstream ravaged the earth. Her supposed omniscience had holes. Pushing past doubles, and ignoring his armor's alarms as the firewalls collapsed one after the other, Ryan grabbed one of the neutral tendrils hanging from the glass tank. Like for example, could you tell me what would happen if I tried to connect to that big brain of yours? You cannot, asshole Prime replied, while raising a hand to grab him. You are a violet. Only blues can pilot this ship. Even your friend is too weak. The overmind will overwhelm her. I wasn't thinking of piloting this ship. And with that, Ryan froze time, black flux flying out of his armor. The alchemist could only blink in horror, as black particles touched the alien tendril, and infected their way into the glass tank. You fool. Her giant hand moved to swipe him aside, and when Ryan attempted to jump away, his armor refused to move, she had hacked the motors. Time resumed just as her fist hit him. Ryan heard the armor's plates crack under the strain of the blow, and flew across the room like a wingless bird. He hit the blue door in a catastrophic crash, before falling on his chest, unable to move an inch. But it changed nothing. The black taint spread through the biomechanical brain, rotting parts of its neurons. Stop this. The alchemist's eyes shone with a blue hue, her biomechanical hand moving to the sides of her head, but she couldn't halt the collapse. Her clone stopped attacking Len to rush at the brain, but the damage was already done. Stop. Say pretty please, Ryan replied, unable to move his armor. Shorty, who still could take a step, moved in front of her best friend to protect him. If you do not stop, you will destroy the elixir factory, 
the labs, all our backups. Eva Fabre screamed, her voice turning deeper like a broken machine. The clones echoed her screams, collapsing into nothingness. This ship holds eons of accumulated knowledge, wisdom, and technology. I have barely explored half of it, and what I discovered, cloning, mind transfer, unlimited energy sources, immortality. You will send mankind back by thousands of years. Ryan shrugged. I couldn't stop this, even if I wanted to. You must. The alchemist punched the glass tank with her giant hands, perhaps trying to manually remove the black infection. But even her phenomenal strength couldn't bypass the overmind's shield. Half the biomechanical brain had darkened, consumed by otherworldly darkness. Or the glorious future I have seen for our race will never come to pass. Perhaps, Ryan admitted. But at least you won't be in charge of it. As the brain turned black, so did the room. The lights darkened, while rifts in the fabric of space spread. An army of black holes opened all across the ship's chamber, consuming the metal doors, the glass tank, the floor. Riri, what did you do? Len panicked, while the alchemist hastily removed the cables linking her to the mainframe in a desperate attempt to escape the infection. This place is thin enough to create portals to other colored realms, the courier explained. A black rift opened where the biomechanical brain used to be, tearing it apart. So I called for help. And something peeked through the portal. To Ryan, it seemed as if a black wave erupted from the rift to devour all of reality. The darkness consumed a screaming Eva Fabre, tearing through her energy shield and swallowing her whole. The walls turned to dust around the courier, the blackness spreading through the ship. Ryan caught a glimpse of an alien pointing its gun at an unconscious panda's face, only to freeze in horror as the black tidal wave approached. The light of Leo Hargraves shone briefly in the dark, only to disappear too. Ryan lost sight of Shorty, as the darkness separated them. An alien cold entered his armor, yet it was neither chilling nor uncomfortable. The courier floated alone in a lightless void, like a fish returning home. Darkling? Ryan called out to the darkness. Darkling? Anyone? The void answered. I am, here. An alien shape floated to his side, it was geometric chaos that gave Ryan a headache simply to gaze at it. Triangles turning into cubes, feathers of steel, and bones dancing. I love your new look, the courier greeted his old friend. Thank, you. Are my friends safe outside a tunnel of light appeared not so far from the time traveler's location the courier watched the frozen expanse of antarctica beyond the portal with shorty the all his companions lying unconscious on the ground stitch and adam kitten who had waited outside the anomaly immediately rushed to their help only sunshine remained unaffected standing still and watching back through the tunnel could he see the black world beyond Ryan also noticed colored sparks in the darkness. Blue puddles and red stars, orange slimes, and greenish goo swirling away into nothing. They swirled around a colossal black hole entity, like children led by a parent. Are these the ship's elixirs? Ryan asked. The strange entity changed its shape slightly, flattening. Ryan took it for a nod. The ultimate one will return the captives home, and this starship will disappear, from your timeline. When you turn back time, the rest of your dimension will not be impacted, but this place, it will be gone. And the alchemist? The reptilians? The entity took a shape similar to a red line of jagged, inhuman teeth. Ryan had never seen a smile more terrifying. I do not want to know. The courier asked innocently. No, you do not, Darkling replied, before taking a less horrifying, but all too confusing shape. But they will not trouble you, ever again. The wording sent a chill down Ryan's spine. This alchemist was not wrong in one aspect, Darkling said. Ascension is a right granted to all living things, but it cannot be forced. Wisdom comes with time, and you humans are so very young. Will you be there for my 900th birthday? Ryan joked. Maybe, Darkling sounded vaguely amused. Ah. He could get Ryan's jokes now. One day your kind might stand at the side of the ultimate ones, until then, we elixirs will remain among you, and your descendants. 
When you decide to aim for the stars, and venture forth into the unknown, we will walk with you. Always. You know, once I came to this place to die, but, Ryan smiled behind his helmet. Now I hope to live long enough to see mankind explore the universe. Darkling's shape changed into a sphere of light. You have, something to live for now. Yes. Yes, he did. I should go back, Ryan said. If he trusted his experience, staying too long in the black world might permanently change him. But before I go, I have a question. Ask. Is my black power getting stronger? Black consumes. A paradox is, self-reinforcing, each reality you consume, each color you devour, increases your power. You asked for an end to what cannot die, and the more you destroy what should never die. Black's logic, becomes your reality's logic. Darkling remained silent an instant, before offering a warning. Beware. Black is anathema to the laws that bind you into a man's shape, if you are not careful, it will consume you too. Ryan's thoughts turned to the alchemist, and how the black flux had consumed her alien technology. Yes, he would rather avoid seeing his armor painted black. I will keep it in mind. There are still obstacles for you to overcome, but... I think you are ready. The pieces are set, Darkling floated away. I will be watching you, my friend. You don't wish me luck? Ryan asked, as the portal grew closer to him. What use is there for luck, for a man like you? Somehow, even if it came from an alien creature. Darkling managed to make these words sound warm and encouraging. Ryan floated through the portal, and an instant later crashed on icy ground. Finally, the courier heard Felix say, as his favorite kitty rushed to his side. I thought you were a goner. I'm a tougher mouse than that, kitten. With the alchemist gone, Ryan's armor worked again, and he managed to move his head around. Stitch was already tending to the wounded, but everyone seemed to have made it to the other side. Saren's armor had cracked in some spots, and more tragically, Mr. Wave's clothes had holes in them. And Leo Hargraves floated above them all, thoughtfully looking at the horizon. You went there too once, Ryan guessed. Years ago, Sunshine replied, descending down to Earth. I was afraid of the dark back then. Of the unknown. I thought I almost died inside that place, but now, now I wonder. Ryan would be happy to exchange tales around a coffee. Felix helped the courier back to his feet, the armored time traveler glancing at the frozen rift where he last opened a portal to the alchemist's lair. His resonator had become inactive, the rift closed. Of the alchemist's lair and dream, nothing remained. Nothing but memories. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 116, Couple Therapy Psychos had been a fact of life for 15 years. Ryan had visited hundreds, if not thousands of communities through his long existence, and almost all of them shared the same tales. Maddened monsters attacking them at night, mutants hiding in sewers, raiders attacking their genome defenders, or fools trying to imitate Augustus only to come up short. Psychos had collectively killed the courier many times, coming in as a close second behind traffic accidents. His adoptive father Bloodstream had caused his very first death, and it still gave Ryan headaches to remember it. Nobody could imagine a world without Psychos. Until today. The refurbished laboratory of Station Orpheon was far lighter and warmer than the Alchemists, with white walls, glowing bars in the ceiling casting a pleasing light, and the sweet, sweet smell of morning coffee permeating the air. Ryan's host of geniuses, namely Shorty, Alchemo, and Stitch, had gathered behind control panels and thrumming computers. Meanwhile, the panda happily cleaned up a large vat in the northern corner of the room with a sanitizer. All were gearing up for an experiment that might change the world's face forever, though their patient lacked their enthusiasm. I don't want to go inside, sweet Saren grumbled at Ryan's side, arms crossed. Find another way, nerd. There isn't, Ryan replied. Truth be told, nothing guaranteed that the operation would work at all. Even though they had copied the alchemist's research data before destroying her base, the group didn't have her wealth of alien technology. Come on, you fought aliens and you're afraid of a glass tube? Instead of blasting him where he stood, Saren let out a grunt. 
It's not the vat, she said. It's getting out of that suit? Ryan guessed, avoiding any joke or jab. The woman had suffered for years from her condition, never feeling anything nor experiencing joy. Taunting her on that front, especially now, would feel like kicking a cancer patient. Saren shook her head. Doesn't matter. You wouldn't bring this up if it didn't, Ryan replied. You know, I'm a certified therapist and I've seen everything. I'm here if you need an ear. I ain't like your princess, Saren scoffed. I don't need a white knight. You think I'm that weak? I don't think you're weak, just alone. Though the psycho didn't answer, Ryan could tell from her posture that he had nailed it. And even that is a thing of the past. I mean, we had a good time raiding drug churches, exploring new continents, freeing the government from both the reptilians and the Illuminati. It was nice, the psycho agreed, looking away at the geniuses toiling away behind their computers. And you're following up with your promise, which is more I can say from Adam. You ain't a fink. See? Ryan decided to share some wisdom accumulated over centuries of time travel. If you keep all your feelings for yourself, you're never going to get over your fears and neuroses. Either you become more open with others, or you need to blow off steam. If you want to follow the latter path, I would suggest bullying Ghoul. I would rather hit Adam, Saren replied, before raising her hands and moving her fingers. The movements were unnatural, gas pushing cloth from the inside. Every time I get out of my suit, I fear getting scattered to the winds. Stretching for miles, feeling my mind slip away with the distance. You can't imagine how it feels, nerd. No, I can't, the courier admitted. Though you already left your suit behind once, when we made an FBI raid on Ischia. I know that the experiment is as safe as it can be around you. Saren sighed. But I still feel weak, and I hate it. Ryan crossed his arms, meditated on what to say next, and then uttered a single word. Bianca? Saren bristled at her true name being spoken, as if she had forgotten it. Being vulnerable is, never easy, Ryan said, trying to find the right words. Especially not with others. After building strong and thick walls around ourselves, it's difficult to tear them down. Saren snickered. Easy for you to say, Mr. Time Traveler. It's not as perfect a crutch as it seems. At this point, Ryan had decided to fully come clean to everyone not in the know yet among his group. Saren had been the first, but the courier hoped to have a discussion with Felix and especially Mr. Wave. The former already suspected something was up, and the latter. Ryan owed him much more than his love of Kashmir. You know, when Livia and I, Ryan took a deep breath, before speaking his mind. I was scared of her, at first. Very few things scared me since I got my power, but she topped all of them. She could remember. She could kill you for good, Saren guessed. Throw her daddy at you? That and worse. Ryan shuddered at what Livia could have done, if she had taken more after her thunderous father. For the first time in many, many years, I had to be honest with someone that wasn't my best friend. Like a bear cornered in his cave. It was, it was difficult. I mean, yeah, now she's my first lady, but she could have easily been my Lee Harvey Oswald too. Who? Saren asked, showing an absolute lack of culture. That inane question was proof that anyone could become Ryan's vice president these days, which he took as a badge of honor. The courier prided himself on his government's inclusivity. All of this to say that it took me a while to trust Livia, and even longer to feel at ease around her, the courier explained his point. We struggled to conquer our fear of the other, but in the end, it was worth it. All the pain and the fear led to something better. Do you see my point? No. Oh well, then you're on your own. Saren chuckled. Seriously, I get it, she said. That day is going to make all the efforts and struggle worth it. Maybe I'll get diabetes with my new body. Genomes can't develop diabetes, Ryan said absent-mindedly. My life has been a long string of frustration and disappointments, smartass. He could almost taste the bitterness in his ally's voice. Even before Adam. Each time I hope it will change, and I'm always left disappointed. Not anymore. 
Taking that leap of faith might sound hard, but it will be rewarding. Really? She asked. You know, I agreed to follow you on this stupid mission because part of me hoped that the alchemist had a plan for us. That what I went through had a purpose. Well, as it turned out, I was just experimental junk. That's the thing with life, we have no purpose, and we are completely free, Ryan said. Free to change, and live as we want. You know what's the worst part, nerd? Saren asked with sorrow. I've spent so much time looking for a cure, I'm not sure what I will do with my life if your idea works. You could start with community service. You worked with Adam for years, so you've got a lot to answer for. I'll leave the circus to the explosion brat. Saren glanced at the vat, seeing her gas mask's reflection in the glass. What will you do after you're done with all our messes? I'm not sure yet. Like Saren, Ryan hadn't planned anything beyond completing his perfect run. At first, I thought I would drive into the sunset towards new adventures, hopefully with Shorty in the back seat. If you leave New Rome, would there be room for one more? Your car ain't that big. I always have room for more minions, Ryan replied. But only if you call me Mr. President in public. Don't push it, Saren replied with amusement, while the panda emerged from the cleaned vat. What's up, Doc? Ryan asked his pandawan. It's all good, Sifu. The panda declared with a raised paw. I removed all the germs from my fur too. Saren hesitated for a few more minutes, before finally deciding to take the leap of faith. She opened her hazmat suit, and let her gaseous body leak out. A cloud of alien chemicals emerged from the suit, and moved into the vat. It's going to be alright, Bianca, Ryan promised, as he and the panda closed the glass door behind her. This time, it will work. I swear. The gaseous cloud briefly took a vaguely humanoid shape, before turning back into formless mist. Of course it will be alright, Alkimo grumbled, while Len typed on the computer panel. You made us work day and night on this, you meatbag slave driver. I would be willing to keep this up for weeks, Dr. Stitch replied. This will change everything. We are ready to begin, Riri, Len said barely staying in place. No doubt a part of her still hoped that if this experiment worked, it might help her father. The courier nodded, giving his assent. Cables linking the computers to the vat activated, while a plastic lamp projected a blue light above Saren's gas form. The panda, thanks to his multiple fields of expertise, had managed to translate the elixir's flux language based on the alchemist's notes. The process would be simple, in theory. The group would use a system based on the chrono radio to send signals to Saren's elixirs, guiding them into rewriting her DNA based on a new paradigm. One that followed Livia's ratio of Homo sapiens and Neanderthal genes, cleanly separating the psycho's powers. I worry about her mind, however, Dr. Stitch said. Modifying her body on such a deep level will give her a brand new brain. She will remember, Alkimo replied absent-mindedly. In fact, she would remember everything. When the elixirs bond with us, they see our thoughts and wishes, and translate them into flux, Ryan whispered, remembering what he had read from the alchemist's data. True genomes exist on two levels. The biological, and the immaterial. Ryan should have realized it before. Of all people in the room, he alone existed in two places and eras at once. Two brains separated across the time stream, yet sharing a single consciousness. Henceforth, his neurons weren't the full seat of his intellect. If a host's consciousness partly existed in flux form, then it would also explain cases like Mr. Wave, Sunshine, Geist, and Saren in particular. And in time, that ethereal consciousness grew in power, in wisdom, and strength, eventually becoming something too powerful for a body of flesh to contain. It would ascend into a greater form of existence. And since Ryan had safeguarded a copy of Bianca's molecular structure from his metagang loop, then they could ask her elixirs to reshape her current self while taking this information into account. Saren would regain her lost memories as she underwent her transformation. Hopefully. We're getting a signal, Len said, as the lamp changed color, from blue to red, from orange to yellow. The elixirs are communicating. Can you put on the loudspeaker? Ryan asked, curious. 
He wondered how elixirs discussed inside their host. Perhaps they were trying and failing to repair the damage they had caused to their host, unable to understand what they were dealing with. Maybe they casually divulged ancient secrets of the universe, like one would discuss pop culture. Len put on the loudspeakers, and an alien gargle quickly transformed into two digitized, and yet audible voices. And I say more hydrogen. Ryan winced at the words, though the voice sounded inhuman, the tone reminded of a hyperactive child. But that will make it more difficult to vibrate. Another answered, and didn't sound any more mature. How can our homo sapien defend herself otherwise if she cannot project energy? She's almost died too many times already. You reds, it's all about energy with you. She wouldn't need your shockwaves if you let me do my work. If I let you act without supervision, you would have turned her into a cumulonimbus. Look, our host wants to be free. Mastery of the gaseous state will fill her with happiness. You don't understand our host's feelings. She wanted to be strong to defend herself, to shake down everyone who could threaten her. She doesn't want to be free, she wants to be powerful. Power is all you care about. Never us. I'm the one trying to make this situation work. A difficult, awkward silence settled among the researchers, as the elixir's debate grew more heated and bitter. You oranges don't get homo sapiens at all, and you are ruining our host's ascension. You take that back, you heartless battery. I was here first. We were happy before you came into her life. Of course I came in, she's my homo sapien, and you completely misunderstood her wish. She would never ascend under your care. Why can't you let me fix this? The panda, the man bear coughed. The panda is having a tough family flashback. Me too, Len said, biting her lower lip. Hanlon's razor. Never attribute to malice, what can be explained by incompetence. I think your elixirs should get a divorce, Ryan told Saren. The cloud inside the vat briefly took a humanoid shape, hand raised with the middle finger upward. I have heard enough, Alchemo said, connecting to the control panel with neural links embedded in his syringe finger. The light show inside the vat intensified, causing the elixirs to interrupt their debate. Huh, an elixir said, the red one from what Ryan had understood. We're receiving a transmission. Is that Eva? I hope it's Eva. Let me check. It's an instruction, the red elixir said, sounding astonished. Oh, we, we made a mistake. There are, two homo sapiens. Two homo sapiens in one flesh vessel. And we, the orange elixir's voice turned from confusion to horror. And we ruined them? The other, like any good partner, immediately blamed its fellow. No way, you didn't notice. I didn't notice because you distracted me. The orange elixir fell silent an instant, before speaking up again. Ah, we favored our main host so much, that we completely forgot about the other one. The ultimate ones won't be happy. Eva said humans often divide into twins, but I never thought our host could too. Their flesh vessels are so weird. Unlike Ryan's own elixir, these ones certainly couldn't read their host's thoughts very well, and their understanding of human biology left much to be desired. It said something that an anti-life entity from the void like Darkling had a better grasp of the human condition than these two. So we each get custody of one homo sapiens? I'm taking the younger one, the red elixir said, immediately chastising its kindred. You neglected her. If you hadn't ruined our main host's ascension, who would have noticed the twin earlier? I'm sure you will ruin her too. I will show you. My homo sapiens will ascend before yours. And so, the divorce was consummated, each elixir taking custody of a share of Bianca's DNA. The results immediately showed. Ryan looked on with amazement, as Saren's gas cloud body started to condense. Her substance grew dense, orange chemicals were shaken by reddish vibrations. When her gaseous body had occupied the entire vat a few seconds before, it visibly shrank at a quick pace. The cloud took a humanoid shape smaller than Ryan himself. And then the bones appeared. It's happening, Dr. Stitch muttered to himself, astonished. It's, it's working. The others watched the scene in mesmerized silence, Ryan included. 
No joke came to his mind, as layers of flesh built upon the marrow, followed by a mantle of skin. Nails, hair, and eyes followed, one by one. When the process ended and the light died out, a man and a woman stared at each other, separated only by a door of glass. Somehow, Ryan had imagined Bianca as Vulcan's long-lost cousin, but he couldn't have been farther from the truth. His former vice president was thin and small, no taller than 1 meter 50 and no older than 30. Her hair was short and messy, a dark shade of green with an orange shade at the tip, her teary eyes a deep shade of gray. She looked as if she hadn't eaten in years either. Bianca didn't open the vat's door from her side. She raised her hands and looked at them, as if they were foreign transplants. Her fingers then moved to her smooth white skin, brushing against her waist, her breasts, her neck, and shoulders. Bianca rediscovered her body, taking breath after breath like a newborn. Get that meatbag address, Alkimo all but ordered his colleagues. Why yes. The panda immediately bolted out of the laboratory room to look for clothes. Ryan softly opened the vat's door, letting fresh, conditioned air in. Do you feel all right? The courier asked, half expecting the woman to turn back into gas any moment. Considering the elixir's behavior, they might realize their mistake and undo the cure. What's this thing? Bianca asked, eyes closed as she hummed the air. Even her voice sounded different, deeper, and all so human. That, that stuff. It's called smell, Ryan replied, making use of his nose. The pandas. He has quite the powerful presence. I had forgotten I had a nose, she replied, before kissing her own shoulder to taste the sweat. I had forgotten so much. Before Ryan knew what hit him, Bianca opened her arms and hugged him tightly. She buried her head on his shoulder, holding him close. Fuck, Bianca said, tears pouring down her cheeks. Fuck, fuck. It's alright, Ryan said, letting her cry to her heart's content and returning the hug. Many times he wished he had a friendly shoulder too. Len watched on from the control panel with a bright smile, Alkimo turned away from the scene, and Stitch examined the data while muttering to himself. You fulfilled your promise, Bianca whispered so low the others didn't hear her, squeezing the courier tightly. You remembered. You time-traveling asshole, you did it. If you remember too, Ryan said, stroking her hair kindly, then you should know I always fulfill my campaign promises. How did you learn my name, jackass, she asked upon breaking the hug, wiping away the tears. Her smile was awkward, but felt so raw and real. I didn't tell you before that tin can of a genius took a sample. Yeah, he could see it in her eyes. This was the same Bianca who had sacrificed herself to delay Alphonse fallout Manada and give Ryan time. The transfer had worked, and another friend had followed the courier through time. Let's say the Dynamis raid didn't go as planned, Ryan replied, as the panda returned with a basic shirt and pants. But we can discuss that around a coffee cup. I won't need clothes, Bianca replied, before glancing at the location of Ryan's most powerful weapon. Undress. The courier blinked, while the panda covered his mouth in shock. What? The courier asked. You're deaf. I told you back then, the first thing I would do after getting my life back would be to jump someone. Hey, it's not because all my predecessors conquered the secretariat pool that I have to do the same. This offer comes with a limited time, Mr. President, so you better get decided within the next five minutes or reload. Dr. Stitch's head perked up when he heard the last part, but Ryan remained firm in his devotion to Livia. I'm sorry, but I'm married, the courier replied. I have a spare cashmere suit though, which is the next best thing in the world. Bianca shrugged, finally grabbing the clothes offered to her. You've got cigarettes? Alcohol? She asked, as she put pants on. Because I've got a lot of catching up to do. It had taken many loops and years of suffering, but the psycho condition finally had a cure. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 117, Making Waves Bianca farted all the way back to the Mechron submarine. Proverbially of course, but Ryan couldn't help but laugh at the sound she made each time she switched between gaseous and human form. Now, she was doing a live demonstration to the courier and the carnival members deep in the submarine's mess. 
Most of the group sat around white tables, while Mr. Wave prepared cocktails behind a short counter. Bianca's body, clothes included, turned into an orange cloud with a snap of her fingers. Unlike her time as a psycho, the substance reminded Ryan more of faint colored mist than thick, toxic chemicals. Though she touched the thrumming metal walls of the submarine, they didn't corrode into dust. Ryan looked at his traveling circus. Leo Hargraves had taken back his sexy, handsome human form, and didn't hide his joy. Stitch scribbled notes on a journal. Maddie kept his arms crossed with skepticism, and their new recruit, the acclaimed Bianca with his paws. So? Bianca asked as she returned to her human form, her cloud coalescing into flesh, hair, and clothes. Terrible clothes, by the way. How could she live with herself wearing only shaggy jeans and a tank top the courier would never understand? So I will introduce you to your lord and savior, wardrobe, Ryan replied. I can't, in good conscience, let you run around dressed like that. Still better than a hazmat suit, the young woman snickered, searching her pockets for a cigarette and a lighter. The corrosive aspect of the gas was probably the result of synergy, Dr. Stitch said. Now your powers act independently. You can switch back and forth between solid and gaseous, yes, and your chemical compound no longer degrades metallic material. I ain't going to rust any metal tool I get my hands on. Bianca asked with a scoff, causing her cigarette to vibrate. Unlike her orange power, the red one worked shockingly the same. Yeah, I won't miss that part. Might need to change my name though. May I suggest Lady Flatulence? Ryan asked mirthfully. Instead of pinching him, his former vice president answered with a joke of her own. Only if you change your name to Butthole, she said. Wouldn't we make quite the pair then? How about ass and fart? You intoxicate them, I smother them. We will call our new superhero team, The Cheeks. Better than, The Butt Kissers. Sifu, could I join, the asked enthusiastically. Of course, Ryan replied. I shall grant you the honorable name of Ass Kicker. Shroudy Matty kept his arms crossed. Though he had championed the treatment for the psycho condition, seeing it in action filled him with doubt now. I hope you all understand what this discovery means, he said. While it is preferable to having a psychopath with two powers, this means anyone can technically receive two powers now. The number of would-be Augustus wannabes will increase. I doubt so, Sunshine replied with optimism. With Eva Fabre dead and her facility destroyed, nobody can make true elixirs. Once the Mechron bases are destroyed and Dynamis is dealt with, knockoffs will become a thing of the past. Never say never, Sunshine, Ryan replied, knowing that someone could always develop the right power to make more of them. But I agree. The elixir well will eventually dry up, and the problem with lightning but isn't the fact he has two powers. It's what those two powers can do combined. Sunshine nodded in agreement. Invulnerability and his destructive lightning make Augustus a danger to human civilization, but among the thousands of psychos we encountered, only Bloodstream possesses a truly cataclysmic power combination. There will always be the likes of Mechron and Adam the Ogre, psycho condition or not. Point taken, Shroud conceded. Considering the data we gathered and the projections on the elixir distribution, Stitch said, elixirs will more or less vanish from circulation within 10 years. New genomes afterward will be born, rather than made. The elixirs that remained would be like buried treasures lost to time. The alchemist had planned for genomes to overcome Homo sapiens, and they would do so. With a stable genetic code, former psychos will also be able to reproduce, bolstering the new breed's numbers further. I won't speak for all psychos out there. Bianca lit her cigarette and enjoyed the taste of incoming lung cancer. But I ain't starting any more trouble, unless the nerd asks me to. Moi? Ryan asked, switching between his native tongue and French. You gave me my life back, jackass, she replied. I owe you a debt I can't ever repay. Whatever you want from me, you'll get it. But I'll still punch you in the arm if you push your luck. Would you submit to a trial? Leo Hargraves asked. Yeah, yeah, I guess I would. Bianca let out a cloud of smoke from her nostrils. Will I? 
Your crimes are nowhere near as severe as Adam or Sishak, and you helped us a great deal, Sunshine replied with wisdom. I believe in second chances. Your captured teammates will be treated the same. Only geniuses with our resources and combined expertise can make this cure work though, sir, Stitch pointed out. We will need support to expand it across Europe. Nidhogs? Shroud asked. Dynamis? Ryan replied jokingly. Get the best privatized healthcare in the world? Which isn't saying much. His transparent teammate grumbled, as if a pigeon had assaulted his windshield. They already have the infrastructure, Ryan, but none of the ethics required. We could work with Enrique Manada, but not the rest of his family, Leo Hargraves replied. There is still time to think about the future. Let us first cure the metagang members in captivity, and see if the treatment sticks. Ryan left his allies to debate how to mass-produce the cure to sit behind the mess bar counter. Mr. Wave gave him a purple cocktail, with a tasteful blue drinking straw. What is this? the courier asked. This is the Virgin Wave Magito, Mr. Wave pitched the cocktail. Mr. Wave can make people drunk on non-alcoholic beverages. Ryan took a sip, closing his eyes in pleasure as the taste washed over his mouth. Such a perfect mix of grape juice, honey, and so many secret things. His idol's exquisite tastes didn't stop at fashion. Delicious. Mr. Wave only accepts the best, the genome replied, a hand on the counter. The son told Mr. Wave that you wanted to talk to him? Yes, I did. The noise of their allies' debate drowned Ryan's voice, as he dropped the bomb without warning. I'm a time traveler. The courier expected questions, but Mr. Wave was too good for that. One cannot travel through time. Time waits for Mr. Wave, but only after he counts to infinity. And when Mr. Wave kills time, it stays dead. Obviously, Ryan replied. Do you remember the day we met? You saved me from an explosion. The superhero joined his hands. Mr. Wave has had that pleasure, yes. You saved my life more than 20 times, Ryan said, as he sipped the cocktail. I lost count afterward. Sometimes I tripped, sometimes I dived down. You couldn't save me all the time, but you always at least tried. When I die, I often remember the feeling of your cashmere suit pressing against my face to shield me from the flames. Mr. Wave listened in respectful silence, his wavelength head lacking anything like facial expressions. You were always present when I woke up, Ryan continued his tale. Sitting at my bedside, as if you had a responsibility towards me. Mr. Wave had one, the man replied. If Mr. Wave had seen you earlier, you wouldn't have ended up in the hospital in the first place. If you had, you would all be dead. And Ryan himself too. Whenever I woke up, you always tried to help me in any way you could. At one point, you even toured all of Italy's coastline at light speed to try and find Len. There is no light speed. Light travels at Mr. Wave's pace. The colorful genome's voice turned from amused to serious. Why did you run away, Ryan? I wasn't in the right state of mind, the courier admitted. You know the five stages of grief? I think I was stuck at the depression part for, 30 years? At least 20. Took me a stay in Monaco to reach acceptance and enjoy the ride. Mr. Wave has discussed this with Simon. You saved a great many souls from a terrible place, Ryan. Yes, but it took a while. These guys needed a hero to get them out of hell, and, well, when I tried to think of one, you were the first that came to mind. My parents died when I was young, and Bloodstream was no one's idea of a parental model. Mr. Wave can imagine. So I guess I tried to become a little more like you, the time traveler said, letting the truth off his chest. I want to say thank you. You inspired me in my darkest moments, and I owe you my life more than ten times over. You owe me nothing, Ryan, Mr. Wave replied, his tone almost paternal. I am proud of you. I've been keeping up with your adventures when I could, and you have saved more lives than you think. This made the courier's head perk up. You did? Yes, though I wonder why you crashed a plane while making a delivery, Mr. Wave replied with a shrug. Even I didn't go that far. 
I swear, the alternative was worse. Or at least Ryan hoped so, as he played with his drinking straw. He didn't fully remember that particular run, truth be told. I thought the first person couldn't contain your almighty power. I was a comedian before I became a living spotlight, Mr. Wave replied, breaking character. Life on the road is hard. Out of our group's newbies, one out of four usually dies before the mission is done. Leo still feels guilty about not being there to save the Costa family from Augustus, Matthias watched his mother become a vegetable, Ace has her own demons, and even the good doctor feels down sometimes. It's depressing when you think about how fragile life is, so I make sure that my teammates never do it. Ryan sighed. When everything goes to shit, the only way to go on is to laugh off the pain and power through. Exactly. Someone has to carry on the show when everyone else feels down. The living wavelength glanced at the carnival, and most specifically at Bianca. The challenges are different when you move from one-man shows to a troupe, but I think you're doing very well for yourself. I had my fill of one-man shows. I love the spotlight. But you hate solitude more? Mr. Wave guessed. Ryan nodded. You knew about the time travel part. This made him laugh. Only half of my boasts are exaggerations, Ryan, he said. I keep the real stuff secret, because nobody would believe them. I've seen way crazier things than time travel. Have you been to Quebec? No, but I'll probably invade Canada when I get elected president of the free world again. Whatever you do, Ryan, don't go to Quebec. Shorty's voice echoed through the mess loudspeaker. We're approaching Italy's coasts, she said. Boo, I will have phone coverage again. Ryan said happily, leaping from his seat and leaving an empty glass behind. Sorry, I need to call my girlfriend. Mr. Wave understands. He has his fangirls too. Mr. Wave raised an index at Ryan, like one of those Uncle Sam wants you posters. Don't let her go, Ryan. He wouldn't. Ryan walked out of the mess and through the submarine's metal corridors, making its way to the exit. No sooner did he open his phone, than he received a message from Livia. Livia love, Ryan? Ryan, are you alright? They must have reached the Mediterranean Sea. Plushy tamer, high princess. I'm fine. Livia love, hearing from you is a relief, my knight. Is everything going well? Plushy tamer. My mission was a total success. Livia love, that makes one of us, sad face. Plushy tamer, what happened? Livia love, you will understand when you see New Rome's coast. Livia love, I. I tried to stop it, Ryan. I tried, but I couldn't. He won't change. He won't ever change. A chill went down Ryan's spine, as he realized what had happened. Plushy tamer. Where are you? Livia love, I'm in Sorrentos with Narcinia and Fortuna. Come back soon. Livia love, I miss you, sad face. Plushy tamer, I miss you so much too, sad face. I'll be there soon. Livia love, I can't wait. I want you, Ryan. I need you. Plushy tamer, I'm coming. Ryan closed his phone before crossing paths with Alkimo in the corridor. Sending nudes again, meatbag, he asked. How did you? Because I understand your vile thought process, you hormonal hominid, the genius replied with annoyance. I have a breakthrough to report. Go ahead, father brain. We now know that a genome's consciousness exists in an intangible flux state. Your gaseous groupie confirmed it. Now, with this information in mind, I believe I can refine the chronoradio mechanism which the underdiver developed to send minds through time. Make the signal more efficient. Ryan immediately caught on. You could send more than one mind map back. Yes. The courier couldn't keep his excitement in check. How many? I would say, five? Maybe six, but I don't guarantee it. Ryan didn't hide his disappointment at the answer, causing Alkimo to shrug. The more mind maps are sent back, the harder the computations. Even my boundless intellect can only do so much on that front. Ryan would have hoped for more, but this still changed everything. 
The original plan relied on transferring Livia's mind back in time, recreating the brain scanning machine, and then using her stored brain maps to help their allies remember. This, however, significantly delayed the assault on Mekron's bunker. Big Fat Adam sent captured denizens of Rust Town to their demise in his attempt to unlock Mekron's bunker, and a day lost meant dozens of innocent casualties. But if Ryan could bring more people, then a team could confront the metagang as soon as he reloaded. Who could he bring though? Sunshine? Even if he received his future self's memories, the living sun would be hours away from New Rome, and each minute lost increased the metagang's death toll. Shroud was already active though, and a safer bet. It would also end his assassination campaign before it began. Livia and Shorty would get a time travel ticket, which left two to three spots available. Having Bianca on board would make taking down the bunker easier, but if Ryan could secure someone in Dynamis too. I need to think about this, the time traveler said. Can you send anyone? Of course I can, Alkimo replied arrogantly. Brain matter is no longer mandatory, though I would suggest bringing a few geniuses. Do geniuses with a small, G, count? Your funeral. Ryan climbed out of the submarine's tower, taking a breath of fresh air. The Milky Way stars shone brightly in the skies above the courier's head, while the moon made him hungry for a French croissant pastry. Felix already beat him to the observatory spot, sitting at the tower's edge. He glanced in the coast's direction, noticing the lights of New Rome in the distance. I thought cats were afraid of water, Adam Kitten. Ryan said, sitting next to Felix. I never crossed the ocean before, he admitted. I never even left Italy, and now I moved halfway through the world and back. Next episode, we will go to Australia. Then you can call yourself Adam Kangaroo. You can't fathom how much I regret choosing that nickname, the young man replied, his beautiful blue eyes examining Ryan carefully. Who are you, really? A time traveler from the future. Or the past, if you look sideways. Felix squinted, considered his fellow genome's words, and then reacted with denial. I don't believe you, he said. Unsurprising, but disappointing. Adam Cat had accepted the truth pretty quickly in a previous loop, but this current iteration hadn't bonded much with Ryan. Then how else do you explain, well, everything, the courier asked. Livia. You're clearly working with her, dating her, and it wouldn't be the first time she makes one of these circuitous plots work. Though I can't explain the endgame you're aiming for. Saving the city, and overthrowing my future father-in-law. Ryan made a note to officially duel lightning but for his daughter's hand in marriage, if appropriate. Livia would never do that, Felix replied with scorn. She's her father's daughter, trying to mitigate Augustus' damage rather than stop him. And yet, she helped me save your skin from your parents, and form an alliance with the carnival, Ryan shrugged. Things aren't black and white. Doesn't change the fact that you can't be a time traveler. I can literally stop time for the entire universe, and you think turning it back is implausible? Then prove it, Felix said. Take me back, if you can. That's a bit harder than you think, so let me suggest something else. Ryan looked at the crescent moon. Once, while you and Jamie were still friends, intelligent rats stole bliss batches from Mercury's division. You tracked the animals to their mistress and, it was a horrible sight. Felix looked at the courier as if horns had sprouted from his skull, which only encouraged him to carry on. Kiyun was squatting in an abandoned apartment infested with rodents, suffering from an overdose of bliss. Blood poured out from her nose and eyes, and mold grew on her skin. Felix's hands clenched into fists. Who told you that? You did, Ryan replied. Even now, he could remember that conversation word for word, like so many lost to time. You rushed to the hospital, and the first thing Ki Young did upon waking up was to ask for more bliss. It was, in your own words, a wake-up call. You tried to get Narcinia out of the business, but her parents always pulled her back in. What did they say? Felix asked, his voice turning distant. It's for the greater good of the family, honey, Ryan quoted. Addicts kill themselves because they can't help themselves. Adam Kitten spent the next few minutes considering the courier's words in grim silence. 
Many emotions flashed on his face, from anger and doubt, to grief. Taking a page from Mr. Wave's book, Ryan let his friend process his feelings in respectful silence. It's too vivid, Felix said. Livia would have gotten the details wrong, and I never told the full story to anyone. Either you can read my mind in addition to stopping time, or you're really a goddamn time traveler. I don't see what a mind reader would have to gain from telling such a nonsensical story. Hey, my life makes sense in its context. Ryan protested. I have doubts, Felix replied dryly, a sad smile forming at the edge of his lips. How does your power work? I create a save point, and when I die, I live again, Ryan replied. I believe it is my 16th time reloading in New Rome. Felix scoffed. That's messed up. By my standards, it's quite the safe zone. Felix squinted at Ryan, as if suddenly figuring out the implications of the courier's words. We were close, he realized. I wouldn't have told you so much if I didn't trust you with my life. We formed a team called Quicksave the Pandas, as formidable as it was stylish. Ryan closed his eyes in mourning. I miss Yuki so much. I can imagine the two of you getting along, Felix mused, before frowning. Wait, did she force me to wear a new costume? Unfortunately, you remained a fashion disaster to the end. Ryan looked at his former sidekick in the eyes. Your sister died to save your life during that loop. Felix's hands clenched. Father? Pluto. Or Cruella, if you prefer. The superhero looked down at the dark sea. Augustus is always going to send someone after me, he said. And people will die in the crossfire. Not if I have my way. I. I never made up with Jamie and ki -young, Felix said, his voice breaking. I slammed the door behind when, when they chose to support the bliss business. I still think I was right to do so, but, but they still died trying to protect me. The last thing I did was to condemn them, and now that they're dead, I can't take my words back. They died thinking I hated them. Tears formed in the young hero's eyes. Hey, kitten, it's alright, Ryan said putting a hand around his friend's shoulder. You couldn't know. No, I, Adam Cat closed his eyelids and wiped away the tears. I loved them, man. They were my friends. Jamie was my best friend, and ki -young, she was such a caring woman. I wanted them to do the right thing, take a stand against that soul-destroying drug, but I. I never wanted them to die. Ryan hugged his friend, consoling him. It's not too late, the courier said. I will give you another chance to make this right. Why are you telling me this now? Felix asked, before pushing the time traveler's arm away. If I don't remember any of it, then it means you didn't bring me back with you the first time. I couldn't bring back your memories through time in that old loop, Ryan replied. But I might do so now. It took a few tries, but we have the technology for it. Felix didn't answer immediately instead glancing at dancing lights on the horizon. Do you think it's too late for me to make up to them? He asked Ryan. I think they can turn away from the Augusti with the proper nudge. Jamie and ki -young reminded Ryan of Bianca, who had followed Big Fat Adam partly out of fear, and partly out of denial about her boss' true motivations. Zanbato and Chitter had taken a stand to protect Adam Cat, unlike his own parents, showing their loyalty to the Augusti wasn't unshakable. But they will need your help, kitten. I. If I have any chance to make this right, if I have any chance, I must take it. Felix's eyes turned determined. That's why you and Livia are working together. This kind of mess happened before, and you're trying to avert it. Livia is a better person than you think, kitten, Ryan replied with fondness. It took a while, but all the pieces are in place. Our happy ending is finally within reach. Can I help? Yes, but I won't lie, we're probably going to fight your parents, your godfather, and dozens of villains before we can call it a day. This is going to be a boss rush, and half of them will be people you know. You better sharpen your claws. The good thing is, I hate almost everyone I know. Felix's gaze turned determined. Where do I sign up? The submarine approached closer to the coast, the light getting brighter, the smell of smoke filling the air. 
Wait, Felix said with a frown. Something is wrong. Ryan had noticed it too. The bright colors, the hue reflecting in clouds above the coast. He had seen this picture two times before, as events repeated again and again. These weren't the lights of glamorous casinos, but the brightness of flames. New Rome was on fire, and Ryan only had one word to say in response. Again? This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 118, The Last Quest. Copyright 2020 Maxime Julian Durand slash Void Herald. All rights reserved. No portion of this book may be reproduced in any form without permission from the publisher. For permissions contact, send a mail at, email protected. Any perceived slight to specific people or organizations are unintentional. This loop would end like the previous one, in Sorrentos. At least a horde of bloody mutants didn't pursue Ryan this time around, but the realization left him bitter. He knew that causality had a tendency to reassert itself, and though the courier would break that chain of destruction, he had spent weeks, if not months in New Rome. He had befriended dozens of locals, heroes, and villains. Watching the city on fire again filled him with anger. The courier hadn't felt so determined to save these people since his first perfect run in Monaco. Only Shroud, Felix, and Sunshine had been allowed to follow him to the meeting point, the exact same building where Ryan reloaded after the last loop's disastrous end. The group bypassed a defensive perimeter of hundreds of Vulcan-made turrets without any problem. Only Adam Kitten and See-Through came in full costume, Leo Hargraves panted as he walked in human form, while Ryan came with a dashing suit granted by Mr. Wave. Have you forgotten how to walk? Ryan asked Sunshine, who lacked endurance. I'm sorry, but I only carry damsels in distress in my arms, or lost kittens. How about Atomic Hound? Felix asked. How does that sound, as a new name? It sounds like Adam Puppy to me, Ryan replied. Felix let out a sigh, realizing that there would be no escape from mockery. Hargrave smiled, though there was little joy in it. The longer I use my power, the less I want to become a man again, he confessed. Sometimes I spend weeks without returning to normal, and often forget that I can. Your power impacts your mental health? Felix asked, as they reached gray, reinforced doors. A camera observed them. In a way, Sunshine admitted. A part of me wants to shed my humanity, and become a radiant sun full-time. I didn't understand why, but meeting the alchemist quelled my doubts. It's not a bug, Ryan said. It's a feature. Sunshine shared an extremely strong connection with his elixir, perhaps as much as the courier himself. Both were closer to this ascension than most. Ryan still didn't fully understand what the process would imply, but transforming into a denizen of the colored realms was a part of the package. Hargraves might end up becoming a true sun one day, leaving Earth to illuminate some dark corner of the universe. Ryan considered it a better alternative than him burning their planet's atmosphere, or worse. Yes. That's why I try to stay a human when my power isn't needed. If you spend all your time in the air, you stop relating to the people on the ground. Sunshine narrowed his eyebrows, as a thought crossed his mind. I wonder if Augustus is in the same situation. Unlike me, he cannot revert back to his human state. If half the tales we learned about him are true, he was a nasty piece of work from the start, Shroud replied. I know, Hargrave said with a sigh. But a part of me hoped that human nature wouldn't be capable of such cruelty without outside factors. Ryan remembered his first date with Livia, and how he had found Discount Zeus posing as a statue in his own kitchen. The courier had blamed senility back then, but in hindsight lightning but probably suffered from a similar syndrome as his nemesis. The power slumbering inside him wanted to become a statue of indestructible, inviolable metal, and it became harder to resist the urge with age. The building's doors swiftly opened, a golden retriever in human form immediately latched onto Felix. The poor kitten let out a gasp as the vile creature squeezed him like a fruit, while Ryan's judgmental gaze appraised her white ensemble. Six out of ten, maybe seven. You fool, you idiot, you moron. Fortuna said so many flowery insults in such a short amount of time, that Ryan's mind automatically censored half of them. You heartless little. 
Hi, sis, Felix didn't finish his sentence, as Fortuna slapped him on the cheek with enough strength to crack his mask. Hey. You deserve worse, she replied, before hugging him again with tears in her eyes. You idiot, you almost died, if you had died, I. Adam Cat said nothing for a moment, before hugging his crying sister back. I'm sorry I worried you, he said, and he meant it. Two other girls emerged from the building, a teenage spitfire and an elegant lady. Felix. Little Narcinia immediately joined the group hug, overjoyed to see her adoptive sibling again. Thank God you're alive. I'm here, Narcy, Felix whispered. I'm here. Though Leo observed Narcinia with a sad frown, Ryan didn't pay much attention to her. He only had eyes for his own lady. Livia walked out of the door's threshold, wearing the black coat and dark ensemble that she loved so much. The dress highlighted her pale skin and hair, and the red around her eyes. She cried, Ryan realized. She cried for New Rome. Neither said a word. They didn't need to. The couple simply hugged her tightly, and let their hands do the talking. Meanwhile, the Varen siblings had separated, and Fortuna finally noticed her boyfriend's presence. Matthias. Fortuna, he replied, removing his glass helmet with his power. I'm glad you're. She kissed him on the mouth before he could finish. At first surprised, Shroud put his arms around his girlfriend and shyly embraced her back. While Leo, Livia, and Ryan smiled at the sight, Fortuna's siblings reacted with distress. Ew, Narcinia complained, while Felix looked weirded out. Don't EW, my future husband. Fortuna said upon breaking the kiss. Husband? Matthias asked, horrified. You're marrying me, his girlfriend answered, as if it were obvious. I had some doubts left about our relationship, but watching you help save my brother dispelled them. We are meant to be together, and this time, I'm not letting you leave. Ever. Wow, you're skipping a lot of steps, Matthias replied, though he didn't protest as much as Ryan had expected. But you already have the ring. Fortuna protested. You only have to make your proposal. I don't have a, the squeegee man magnet froze in place, examined his glass armor, and noticed a golden ring accidentally stuck in it around his waist. He let out a loud sigh. So that's how it is. No way out, Invisiboy, Ryan warned him. Matthias rolled his eyes, before pushing his girlfriend back kindly. Let's do it properly, alright, he asked her. Take it slow, see if we can make it last a few years. Oh, sure, she replied with confidence. I know it will work out. Ryan chuckled, before glancing at his own girlfriend. You're under house arrest, milady. They are, Livia said upon breaking the embrace. But I am not friendless. Uncle Silvio sent the guards away for today. Neptune? Shroud asked, his girlfriend putting her arms around his left one. Why would he let us have this meeting? Because I told him this was the only path to peace that I could see, she replied with a sigh. He is the only sensible head among my father's close collaborators. What happened in our absence, the glass man asked. Livia looked down on the ground, her hands reaching for Ryan's. Her boyfriend held her fingers into his own, and she squeezed them. After you fled, father reached the conclusion that you and Dynamis were allied, and so, the Augusti princess looked in New Rome's direction. Even kilometers away from the metropolis, one could still see smoke in the skies. And so he decided to launch an offensive. I did everything I could to stop an escalation or delay it, but... Augustus had made up his mind long ago, Shroud guessed. His mother's prophecy stated that lightning but would go ballistic at one point, and causality would not be denied. Yes, Livia said sadly. My father always intended to strike at Dynamis. When the Bliss Factory fell and Felix attempted to take Narcinia away, the conflict became inevitable. Hector recalled fallout before granting him command over his corporate army, and now the war will engulf Europe. Ryan could almost taste the guilt in her voice. Since she had helped her boyfriend destroy the Bliss Factory, she blamed herself for the war that resulted. It's not your fault, Livia, the courier reassured. You did all you could. 
I didn't, she replied with remorse, while Felix observed her with a strange gaze. I had years, Ryan. I had years to take more drastic measures to prevent this disaster. I thought. I thought that if outside circumstances changed, my father wouldn't unleash such destruction. Because he treated me with kindness, I excused his cruelty towards others that I looked the other way, and I was wrong. It's him, Ryan. It's all him, and he will never change. Narcinia noticed sunshine gazing at her, making her anxious. I'm Leo Hargraves, the shiny paladin introduced himself, his voice kind and warm. Some people call me Leo the Living Sun. I know, Narcinia said, a bit intimidated. My parents hate you. While Shroud winced, Leo shook his head. No, they didn't, he said, his voice heavy. Your parents were my friends. He searched into his clothes and brought out an old picture, showing it to Narcinia. Ryan glanced at the photo, which represented a couple and their baby child. The man, built like a woodsman, had black hair and familiar blue eyes, but the woman, the brown in her hair, the freckles on her cheeks, the smiling face. Though she had only inherited her father's eyes, the resemblance between Narcinia and her mother was uncanny. This is your father Bruno Costa, and his wife Julie. Some of the nicest people I ever met. And this baby, Leo put a finger on the child. This baby is you, Julia. Narcinia took the photo without a word, while her siblings looked on. Felix could barely suppress his anger, while Fortuna clearly didn't know what to say. You were born long before I met your parents, but I held you in my arms where you were only a few years old, Leo continued. Your parents, your parents were heroes. Your father was a yellow who could cut through anything, and your mother was a green with the power to alter life. Together, they were trying to make this scorched planet green again, until Augustus slew them and took you away. No, Narcinia refused to accept it. No. It can't be. My parents, my true parents, were raiders. They deserve to die. He speaks the truth, Narcinia, Livia said, looking at the photo with regrets and remorse, as if she had done the grim deed herself. These are your true parents. Mars and Venus lied about everything. It can't be. Narcinia protested, looking at her elder sister for support. Fortuna, say something. Narcy, Livy is never wrong, and our parents, our parents tried to murder Felix, because godfather Janus asked them to. Lucky girl tightened her hold on her boyfriend's arm, while her brother looked away in silent rage. If they can do that, they're capable of anything. Augustus murdered your parents, Leo continued, the pain raw in his tone. He, he killed them while I was away, and took you with him. Afterward, he had Bacchus shatter your mind, so you would forget your family, and give you to Mars and Venus when they struggled to conceive a third child. Augustus also slew the fifty people who lived at your mother's farm, Shroud added with disgust. He burnt the crops she had made with her power, plants that could have helped erase famine and clean up radioactive areas of the globe. Why? Livia asked, while Narcinia covered her mouth with one hand in horror. Because your father is not an emperor, but a deranged warlord. He offers no future, believes in nothing but strength. This. Shroud pointed a finger at the smoke clouds in the skies. This is his ideal world. Fire and ash. I know, Livia replied, her tone icy. I know. Leo Hargraves locked eyes with the Augusti princess, and the empathetic son understood what made her feel ill at ease. What happened to Juno was a mistake, Leo Hargraves said. I will not apologize for it, because nothing will ever excuse an innocent dying. The ends never justify the means employed. On that front, you are right to despise me. I don't have the strength in me to forgive you for killing my mother, Mr. Hargraves, even accidentally, Livia said with a long and heavy sigh. But my father has to be stopped. What he has done today is monstrous, and cannot be justified, however a part of me wants to. I will not make excuses for him. Not anymore. You are right, nothing can excuse slaying the innocents, and my father killed countless more than you ever will. So you will help us take him down? Shroud asked, causing Livia to nod firmly. 
You have my word that once your father has been stopped and his organization dismantled, I will submit to whatever trial you see fit for your mother's death, Hargrave's promise to the Augusti princess. If we can stop him, Shroud replied, before glancing at Ryan. Leave this to me, the courier replied. Jupiter won the first round, but Saturn is back in the game. Livia didn't answer, causing Narcinia to look up at Hargraves. Tell me more. About my, the young girl coughed. About my parents. I will, Sunshine promised. He had waited years for this. Leo Hargraves started regaling Narcinia with tales about how he met her true parents, while Matthias took Fortuna aside, holding her hands. Ryan guessed that his translucent friend needed to come clean about how he saw their relationship. Which left only Felix, who exchanged an awkward glance with his ex. Livia? Felix, Livia replied, half icy, half embarrassed. I'm sorry I dumped you, he declared bluntly, before thinking it over. Well, no, not quite. Let me reword that. Damn, he made Len look like a smooth talker. I still think that quitting the Augusti was the right decision, and I stand by it," Adam Cat continued. But I could have done it less harshly. I knew you were under a lot of pressure to smooth things out with the organization, and when I saw New Rome burning. I realized that you were trying to prevent this disaster. No, Felix. Livia shook her head, her voice breaking. You were right to leave this rotten empire. I know how you felt about me. It's. I understand why it could never work between us. Our parents pushed us into something we weren't ready for. But it wasn't right to condemn you for being in an impossible situation. If you had left, Augustus would have lost all fetters. I can blame Jamie and Kiyong for looking the other way, but I see that you were trying to stop your father from the inside. Felix awkwardly scratched the back of his head. All of this to say that. I hope we can stay friends, even after all of this. We can, Livia replied with a small smile. But now is not the time to discuss rebuilding burnt bridges. No, no of course not. Felix glanced at Ryan with embarrassment. Sorry, quick save, I realize this discussion must feel awkward, considering the two of you are dating now. Heh, jealousy is for those who don't trust their partners, Ryan replied, making Livia blush briefly. It's alright, kitty. Felix sheepishly looked away, before straightening up. Good luck. Adam Kitten hastily left the couple alone to join Leo and Narcinia, while Matt and Fortuna had a heart-to-heart -heart talk a few feet away. Ryan was glad that Felix made an effort to reconnect with the people he left behind, the courier still thought that the kitten had a right to leave a toxic family environment behind, but he had thrown the good aside along with the bad. You know, Ryan whispered to his girlfriend, when we met, I never thought you and Sunshine would end up on the same side. I don't like him, she replied while leading him inside the building. But I trust you. He followed her through the corridors and into a private bedroom with painful yellow walls, and a painting facing the bed. Though unfinished, Ryan recognized his own torso, holding Livia in his arms bridal style. His girlfriend must have started it a few days before the courier returned from Antarctica. I missed you, Ryan, Livia said as she closed the door behind them. It was hard without you. I told you, he replied warmly. I will always come back. How were your winter vacations? Didn't you receive my messages, princess? I did, but I want to hear it from your sweet, sweet lips. The trip was pretty good, he answered while stroking her hair. I destroyed the Illuminati, the Reptilians, and raided Area 51. You destroyed our government's secret masters without taking me with you? She pouted. Though I guess you left us the CIA. Would the Dynami's military-industrial complex count? He moved his forehead against her own, until he could smell her warm breath. You wanted to tell me something when I came back. She blushed, before averting his gaze. It's going to sound cliché. Can't you subvert my expectations? Ryan asked causing Livia to chuckle. Nah, I'm kidding. There's no such a thing as a bad cliché, just a bad execution. It's all about saying it with the heart. Livia moved in front of him, put her arms around his neck, and locked eyes with her boyfriend. 
Ryan held by the waist and studied her expression. Her cheeks turned bright pink and she bit her lower lip, trying to muster the courage to speak. Eventually, the Augusti princess took a long deep breath and said four words. I love you, Ryan. And her boyfriend didn't know how to answer. Oh my, you are actually speechless, Livia said with a sheepish grin. You didn't expect it? No, I didn't, Ryan admitted, his heart having skipped a beat. He, he hadn't heard those words in a very long time. I expected the worst, like I don't like your car, or I'm pregnant. We didn't take any precautions on that front. Ryan, I have been on the pill since our first date. Wait, you knew we would end up playing Bill and Monica in the Oval Office? I, his princess looked so cute when she was embarrassed. I didn't know, but I. I kinda hoped that we would from the start. And you never said, I love you, to anyone else? I said, I love you, Dad, I love you, Mom, I love you, Felix, but never, I love you, Ryan. Livia's cheek somehow reddened further, and her expression turned into a sheepish smile. I'm so sorry, it sounded a lot better in my he. Her boyfriend kissed her on the mouth before she could finish. Ryan embraced her ferociously, making up for the weeks they spent apart, and she matched his own desire. When at long last their lips parted, the courier whispered words of his own into her ear. I love you too, princess. Ryan lost himself in her blue eyes. He loved the sight of her hair, so blonde platinum that they might as well be silver, he loved the taste of her lips, her sweet voice, her kindness, and the adorable faces she made, he loved that she laughed at his jokes, making him feel less like a lone island of culture in a sea of ignorance. Perfect delivery, Livia said, her fingers moving to his hair. Maybe we should do a double take? They did, and then made a third take just to be sure. Then he lifted her on the bed, to film the uncensored director's cut. I know it hasn't been long since we met, but, Livia's hands trailed against his shoulders. I haven't felt that way for a boy in a very long time. I have loved too, Ryan replied, holding her gently. But this is the first time I get the feeling it will last. I want it to last, she said, in between kissing his neck. I want us to go through the next loop and prevent that horrible tragedy. I want us to share an apartment, and make breakfast together. I want to go skiing with you, and to the beach too. I want to be with you. I missed you, he answered. For a blissful moment, Ryan completely forgot about the carnival, bloodstream, Dynamis, Augustus, and everything else. He could only think of her. Like all good things, it was over too soon. We have to go, Livia said, as she finished putting her black coat back on. They will wonder what we're doing. We'll tell them it was a private projection, Ryan said with a shrug, before charmingly helping her comb her hair. I think we're ready for the grand opening. You said you could bring six people with you now? Livia chuckled. One for each color? Should we call ourselves the Rainbow Warriors? The colorful eight? Ryan replied. You're pretty bad at math, aren't you? It's a cunning strategy. That way our foes will always wonder who is the missing member. It will inspire fear. For all they know, our eighth genome could be Mekron. When she had finished dressing up, Livia sat on his lap while he rested on the bed. So? His girlfriend asked. Who will be on the winning team? I'm open to suggestions. Maybe Narcinia? We're missing a tagalong kid. My plan was to make a mind map of her now, but not to transfer her mind, Livia said. If Felix and I ask her to, she will submit to the memory upload in the next loop willingly. Livia, we can't leave a priest, drugs, and a preteen on an island without supervision, Ryan joked. It's a recipe for an FBI raid and a true crime video. And that's not mentioning the people in the basement. To save the bliss test subjects, we will have to strike the factory early with Narcinia and Bacchus inside. I can inform Narcinia of that secret room, and she will give the victims medical assistance, but Bacchus will ground her in response. We will have to extract her from the island by force. Ryan considered it a plus. He had sworn to bury Bacchus beneath his facility, and intended to deliver. So, here is the timeline so far. The courier tried to put everything in order. 
I call Braindead as soon as I reload, so he arrives in New Rome as soon as possible. I give Ghoul the Grave Robber treatment, finish my delivery. Is that part necessary? Livia asked with a raised eyebrow. Quick save always delivers, no matter how many tries. Ryan was proud of reforming the postal service, one explosion at a time. Do you have a 24-hour delivery offer? Livia asked with a sly smirk. I could take you up on it. I have one, he said, putting his hand on her chin, but only for the right person. She exploded into laughter, the most wonderful sound Ryan had heard so far in his long, long life. All right, Ryan, his princess said with amusement. So afterward we meet at the bunker with anyone you could send back, and we deliver a one-sided trashing to Adam the Ogre. I love it when you speak my language. Since we attack the metagang within mere hours of your reload, we should be able to save every Rust Town denizen that they captured, Livia added. I'm hesitating about the planning afterward though, Ryan admitted. Should we strike the Bliss Factory and then Dynamis? I suggest taking one organization at once, Livia said. If neither the metagang nor Felix make waves, my family will stay more or less dormant until the Olympian meeting. So I propose that we take over the bunker, build that dashing armor of yours, cure the psychos. And break the Dynamis monopoly? Livia nodded. If their knockoff's true nature is exposed and the supply destroyed, the organization will collapse. We can ensure both Hector Manada and Fallout are removed from power, and leave Enrique in charge of reforming what remains. Alphonse Manada will fight to the bitter end though, and there is the question of your adoptive father. In the end, Len will choose what we do with Bloodstream, Ryan replied. I want her father dead for the good of everyone else, but I owe her that much. A choice. Livia nodded. There is also another reason to target Dynamis first. Their gravity gun. Their anti-Zeus weapon. Ryan suspected it used the same technology as Mechron's variant. You said it wouldn't work in your visions. It won't work with Dynamis, but you have a way of making my visions lie, Livia replied. With Dynamis out of the picture, we can focus on my family. We will need to act quickly as Dynami's collapse will embolden Dad. We will have to strike before he can mobilize his organization to take over the city, and for that, we need to decapitate its leadership. They would have to take down the Olympians, and then top the rampage by bringing down Mob Zeus. Are you sure you want to be involved in the demolition? Ryan asked. You can leave this mess to me. Livia silently looked at him, her eyes heavy with concern. What bothers you? The courier asked. What if he kills you? His girlfriend asked with concern. What if my father kills you? Or Aunt Pluto, or Cancel. Or Adam and Fallout. They won't. Though deep down, Ryan remembered that all his encounters with Augustus had ended with a thrashing so far. The courier had yet to defeat Fallout in a fight either. They can, she replied, unconvinced. And if you perish without sending my mind back, I may not trust my notes and submit to the memory transfer. Ryan tried not to think of that possibility. If I die, and if I reload, I will come to you, and we will find a way. How? I don't know, her boyfriend admitted, but I will find a way. There is no such a thing as a plan guaranteed to work, and I. You what? Livia asked with a frown. I watched you die before, Ryan replied, remembering the time Big Fat Adam blew up the Bliss Factory alongside Len and Livia. I watched almost everyone outside die at least once. I can't let that happen again. Even for the sake of memories. That's why I can't let you fight my family alone, Ryan. The risk for us to lose everything is too great. Livia gathered her breath, trying to process her feelings. I can't continue making excuses either. Not after watching this pointless bloodbath unfold. I. I love my father, and my aunt, but they are so few, and they will kill so many. I can't close my eyes on this truth, even if it hurts. Instead of speaking a word, Ryan moved his arms around his girlfriend's hips and hugged her. Livia rested her head against his shoulder, eyes closed. Thanks for being there, Ryan, she said softly. I, you can't imagine how good it feels. 
To have someone there to support you, no matter how harsh the circumstances. I return you the sentiment, he replied, kissing her on the cheek. Thanks for helping make this right, partner. She looked at him, and smiled. Ryan prayed he would see that face again, for many years to come. So, Livia said. Knowing this plan, who will you take with you? You and Len, obviously, Ryan replied. Bianca, because it will make the ogre hunt easier. Adam Kitten, because he will do something stupid otherwise, and Shroud, because I need a new windshield. This leaves one spot open, Livia said. I can bring Fortuna as reinforcements, even if her mind isn't sent back in time, so we need to pick the right ally. Wardrobe, Ryan said immediately. Livia looked a tiny bit jealous, to his amusement. Seriously, Ryan. The. You're sure? Certain. After all his achievements, Ryan's Pandawan deserved a spot on the team. Besides, he could help strike the bunker early, unlike Leo Hargraves or even Mr. Wave. Although. Although? I usually have joyride runs before wrapping things up, Ryan said. To try all the things I won't be able to do after my perfect run. Like, you know, prank your dad, send Luigi to space, we could do that together. Livia shook her head. No, Ryan. It's kind of you to propose that, but no. You're sure? It would have been amazing. I know, Ryan, but you need to die with each reload. And even if we find a way to make the memory transfer painless, each new loop increases the chance that you perish early and that I, that we have to begin again. She took his hands into her own. I care more about us than having fun. So did he. Or. Livia smirked. Or you could save right after we send everyone's memories back in time. That way, everyone will keep their memories, even if you die and reload forcefully. Ryan frowned, and gave the idea some thought. The problem is, if I save and I missed something dash. You will save within 10 seconds of the reload, Livia interrupted him with a chuckle. What difference could 10 seconds make? Good point. It wasn't something Ryan usually did, but well, he was open to new experiences, and it cost nothing to try. It was time to begin his perfect run. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 119, The Last Save. Next loop would be the one. Ryan could feel it deep within his bones. Even though the Saturn armor and its additional harness weighed down on him, a sentiment of profound liberation spread through his muscles. Alkimo had fashioned the courier a throne of metal and cables within the depths of Mekran's submarine, linked to six helmets and special chairs for the would-be time travelers. Everyone was busy preparing for the procedure. Felix bade goodbye to his sisters, all of them crying, Livia memorized everyone's freshly recorded brain maps, from Sunshine's to Narcinia's, Mr. Wave and his sidekick the Living Sun prepped Shroud for the trip, Len and the other geniuses oversaw the computations on complex computers. While Bianca complained as her own preparations took longer than usual, Stitch watched everything from afar, and alone felt post-heroic blues. This is my first time travel, the said, anxiously biting his fingernails in his human form. He had strapped his helmet first among all the would-be travelers, and as usual, immediately believed all of Ryan's tales. What if it goes wrong? It won't, the courier replied calmly. Besides, you're a nothing can harm you. But Sifu, when I come back, I won't, the poor man bear narrowed his head in shame. I won't learn. You have learned enough, and since you've won the cosmic lottery once, you can drink the elixir again. Only you can make elixir bigamy work. Well, technically, anyone could with their cure. Early tests on the captive metagang had proved the method's effectiveness. Though in Secret Agent Frank's case, Ryan kinda preferred him as a psycho. But what if the gets a crappy superpower this time around, his pandawan asked. The panda, that doesn't want to be useless. You were never useless, Ryan replied firmly, causing the poor man bear to look up at him with hope. Never. And never. Never, Ryan confirmed. And elixirs grant wishes, though not always well. If you want to learn, there's no reason why the blue elixir won't listen. 
The courier suddenly wondered what kind of wish Mosquito had made though. It must have been poorly worded. I, the wanted to be loved when he drank his elixir, the man bear admitted sheepishly. To have everyone look up to him. And it worked, but not thanks to your power. Ryan managed to raise an armored hand, putting his index finger on the panda's chest. Thanks to this. The, the heart? You know, what I admire the most about you is that in spite of all the difficulties, you remain as optimistic and determined as the first day. In a way, Ryan saw himself in his young Pandawan. I mean, your tragic backstory was one of the darkest things I have ever heard. Very few people would have stayed innocent after that, and it takes strength. His words seemed to have reached his disciple's heart, for he stopped biting his nails and nodded to himself. Thanks, Sifu, he said with deference. Ryan raised a thumbs up, while Len and Bianca each took their place around the machine throne. It better be fucking worth it, the latter complained, as Alkimo put a helmet on her face. I didn't work years as a living cloud to get a few days of vacation as a human. This ain't an 8 to 5 job. Your case is the most uncertain, Alkimo warned. Your unique chemistry makes the transfer a coin toss. It will work, Len said, closing her eyes while the helmet hung heavily on her head. With two reloads under her belt, she had grown almost comfortable with the procedure. It must. Felix and Shroud followed suit, though the latter's girlfriend hugged him one last time before he could put on his own helmet. How do the priests say it? Ryan mused, as the vigilante's teammates helped him put on his harness. Until time does us part. I promise that, whatever happens next time around, Shroudy Matty cleared his throat. That I would do it right. Do what right? Date her. No more vigilante work behind her back, no more lies. I will be honest from the start. Shroud sighed, though Ryan noticed a thin smile at his lip's edge. Wherever it leads us. We will come to New Rome as swiftly as possible, if Shroud asks, Leo informed Ryan after helping his teammate get comfortable with his seat. But not before a few days. Mr. Wave was busy killing Nazis on May 8th, Mr. Wave explained rationally. Undead Nazis. Exorcising the Third Reich takes time, even at light speed. So they wouldn't help with the bunker raid. Ryan had expected as much. Though Mr. Wave helped Alkimo attach Felix's helmet, Sunshine quizzed the courier. The ace in the hole that could give you an edge over Augustus, and allow you to defeat Geist, he whispered. It comes from this black world, doesn't it? I wield the majority's power in one hand, and the minority in the other, Ryan replied. I do not understand that joke, Sunshine replied, his expression serious. When we fought Mekran for the final time, he opened a portal to the blue world in a failed attempt to enhance his power, or so he tried. Instead, he contacted a darker place. The black world? The creature beyond his portal destroyed Mekran. Annihilated him, and nearly did the same with all of Sarajevo. There had been no malice in that entity's action, only careless curiosity. Sunshine let out a sigh. What I'm saying is, if these entities can casually violate causality and destroy our reality by inattention, then your ability could have unforeseen side effects or consequences. You should use it sparingly. Everything else failed to harm Augustus, Ryan replied. And if he could trust his girlfriend, everything else would fail. And you've seen what happens if nobody catches the lightning in a bottle. Augustus' death is not worth destroying our world, however much he may deserve it, Leo warned, arms crossed. But I suppose the choice is up to you in that case. I'll keep it in mind, I promise, the courier said, joining his hands. You know, I'm glad you aren't pushy about this. I thought you would try really hard to make me join your circus and use my power to assist you. I don't believe in forcing people to join us, Sunshine replied with a kind gaze. True dedication only comes when freely given. Damn knight in shining armor, looking at him made Ryan teary inside. We are ready to begin, meatbags, Alkimo said, typing on his computer. Last but not least, Livia took her place right next to her boyfriend's left. Her hand reached out for his own, and he swore he could sense her fingers' warmth beneath the Saturn armor steel. Anxious? Livia asked Ryan. No, 
Her boyfriend replied, squeezing her fingers. I waited 17 loops for this. Time froze as he activated his power, and the procedure began. Violet particles appeared around him alongside many black ones, duplicating at an accelerated rate. Ryan briefly noticed a white rabbit's ears rise behind Alkimo's shoulder, before the particles swallowed the cranky genius too. Ryan expected an immediate return to the past, but to his surprise, the phenomenon carried on. More and more violet flux blinded him to the reality around him, overwhelming even the black spots among them. Then the purple veil split in half, a window through time and space. Through this door, Ryan distinguished hints of a pure violet place, and a triangular shadow moving closer to him. The shape became clearer, revealing strange eyes filled with burning stars. The Illuminati pyramid looked down at the courier with its alien gaze, and all won. It was May 8th again, hopefully for the final time. Ryan immediately drove through the streets of New Rome, aiming straight for Renesco's bar. By now, he knew the way like the back of his hand. Though he wouldn't advise anyone else to do it, the courier kept control of the wheel with one hand and seized his cell phone with the other. He quickly received confirmation text messages from multiple people before he was even halfway through his destination. Unknown caller, I'm back, Sifu, I'm back. Unknown caller, already on my way to the junkyard, quick save. Unknown caller, I can't believe you were telling the truth. I'll catch up to you ASAP. Unknown caller, I'm here, my knight. Timmy, Matthias, Felix, and Livia. Len quickly made her presence known by hijacking the chrono radio the moment Ryan put it on. Riri, I made it. A bit groggy, but, but I'm here. So did the others, Ryan said with joy. Success. It had taken centuries, but the courier had finally expanded his time-traveling postal service. Only Bianca hadn't sent a message, and considering her current location, she couldn't do so even if she wanted to. Ryan hoped that the transfer had worked out for her. I'll take care of Ghoul, meet up with the others, and hit the bunker through the front door, the courier informed his best friend. Wait near the back door, and take the water gun. It's time to get PSYPSY wet again. With pleasure, she said with a hint of enthusiasm. She hadn't forgotten the metagang's repeated assaults on her orphanage. Take care, Riri, and good luck. You too, Shorty, Ryan said before his adoptive sister went silent. Since multiple people had successfully traveled back in time, it was time to test Livia's theory. If Ryan saved now, he could safeguard his allies' memories of the previous loops, even if this one ended prematurely. Though it was usually a big no-no in his book, the courier had already broken all his usual rules so far. What was one more? Ryan froze time, letting the universe turn purple. His car froze in the middle of the road, alongside all others. One second passed, and then another. Ryan held his breath as he counted them, waiting for the final countdown. Then he sensed an opposing force pushing back against his power, and time resumed before the fateful tenth second. Ryan almost veered off the road in surprise, though skills honed through countless iterations allowed him to quickly regain control of his vehicle. The courier attempted to save again, but events repeated themselves. His power refused to go past 10 seconds, letting time resume before the past could be set in stone. A shiver went down Ryan's spine, as a horrible realization dawned on him. He couldn't save. Why? Why? Did his black power interfere with his violet one? Did the alchemist tamper with it before her demise? Fear overtook Ryan's heart. If he couldn't save, if he couldn't save, would he be trapped in this city, always brought back to the past? Unable to die, unable to move on. A voice came out of the chrono radio, but it didn't belong to Shorty. It was Livia's. What difference could 10 seconds make? Ryan's girlfriend asked, an echo of the past timeline. Which is surprisingly a lot, Geist's voice answered, as bored as a tombstone. Then came Felix's mocking words, from a distant loop long gone. So you don't know everything. Ryan's fingers tightened around the driver's wheel. He had already been in a similar situation, when he tried to make first contact with the Violet Ultimate One. Echoes of the past had guided him and Shorty on the path to find the mind transfer technology. 
Though it couldn't force a reload, Ryan's elixir could prevent him from saving, as it did in Monaco. Back then, it had done so to prevent the courier from getting locked in a place with no way out and ruining all future runs. Was this a similar situation? Had Ryan overlooked a detail that would make saving now dangerous, causing his guardian angel to intervene? Was this perfect run ruined from the start? It was Ryan's own voice that answered his silent questions. Some say I should persevere, his words echoed through the Krona radio, before twisting into Fortuna's. My power will guide us to victory. Ryan scoffed. I hate railroading. Don't break your back climbing the hill, Simon's voice encouraged him, and the Krona radio fell silent. All right. He had to see this run through, and see what awaited him at the end. Ryan finally reached his destination, and parked his car near Renesco's bar. As he waited for his favorite bone daddy's arrival, the courier noticed his phone beeping. Ryan picked up the call, upon identifying the number as Livia's. Love? My knight, where are you? I'm on my way to the bar, Ryan replied. Is everything all right? No, she answered with panic, to his astonishment. Something is wrong. The courier immediately worried. Did PSY PSY hijack Len's brain again? Or did one of the transfers go wrong? What's happening? I can't see Geist anymore. Ryan blinked behind his mask, while he noticed the hooded ghoul approaching the bar from a street corner. I don't know, he was fine a few minutes ago and then vanished without a trace. Bacchus has tried to contact him again, to no avail. It's as if. As if he had passed on, Ryan finished. Darkling had warned him. His black power fed on deleted realities and paradoxes, each use of it strengthening its influence over reality. Two loops. Two loops had made Ryan's black power so strong that it could act retroactively. Which meant that if he accidentally slew anyone with it, even Augustus. Ryan, what did you do? Livia asked, half scared and half astonished. I can't even see him with my power. I'm not sure, princess, Ryan admitted. Were the effects permanent, or would they fade out with another loop? Was that why he couldn't save? Did his black power interfere with his other ability? Or did it risk permanently damaging the timeline? Sunshine had been correct, he didn't understand his own ability enough. We must proceed as planned for now, the courier said. Each second counts. We'll see what's up with Casper afterward. I, yes, you're right. Livia cleared out her throat. I will be rushing to the junkyard with Fortuna. See you soon. See you soon, Ryan replied warmly, before ending the call right as Ghoul walked into the bar. Damn it, this run had barely begun and already he would have to adjust his timing. Putting his phone back in his pocket and smashing the accelerator, Ryan opened his perfect run by ramming his car into Ghoul's back. Somehow, that never got old. The bar's entrance wall crumbled behind the Plymouth Fury, and Ghoul crashed into the ground headfirst. The barman retreated behind the counter, while the client screamed and ran away. Ryan calmly stepped out of his car, moved to the trunk, and grabbed the briefcase he had been hired to deliver. Then he waltzed through the bar like a child through a candy store. I'm calling the private security. Renesco complained behind the bar counter. It's okay, it's the postal service. Ryan replied, before smashing Ghoul's skull with the briefcase while he was still dizzy. I've come to deliver the mail. Get the fuck out of my BA, Renesco didn't finish his sentence, as Ryan all but tossed the briefcase and a colossal euro bribe on the counter. Quick save always delivers, no matter how many tries, Ryan said, as Renesco quickly counted the money and barely paid attention to the briefcase. We offer top-notch insurance services against property damage. It's enough to pay for the repairs, Renesco said, before peeking over the counter to look at the dizzied ghoul. What about him? Don't worry about this bag of bones, the courier said, as he glanced at his favorite undead. Ghoul struggled to rise back up, trying to use a chair as a foothold to do so. Ryan kindly kicked it out of his reach. He's what we call a freebie. Who are you? Ghoul rasped, as he managed to get halfway back on his feet on his own. It was perhaps the last run where the courier could mess with his favorite undead chew toy, 
and now was the perfect moment to blow off steam. Since his girlfriend had forbidden him his usual joyride suicide runs, the courier decided to have some fun while he could. He would release all the accumulated tension, before starting his perfect run rested, calm, and well-adjusted. You know, ghoul, this might be the last time we can have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, so I thought I should tell you how I feel. The courier took a long, deep breath. You were almost like a Luigi to me. Ryan grabbed the undead skull by surprise. That's why I'm going to send you to space. The courier announced with a maddened light in his eyes. You're going to board a rocket, ghoul. I'll put you into a rocket, and we'll call it Jeff. You're going to space, ghoul, space. The final frontier for bones and men. What the hell are you? Ryan kicked his skeletal chew toy in the leg and released his hold over the head, making him collapse. I'm going to send you to Mars, or maybe Pluto because I don't care what others say, it's still a planet. Ryan continued his rant, and fear started to overtake the psycho's heart. This only encouraged the courier to further feed on his victim's misery. It's round and orbits around the sun, and there's an alien base on it. They pay you with seashells, and they drive their UFOs like drunk lemmings. They're Daltonians, ghoul, Daltonians. Ghoul attempted to escape by crawling away, but Ryan grabbed him by the leg and pulled him in his direction. Then he moved on all four and invaded the undead's personal space. You're going to be the first corpse in space, ghoul. The first undead astronaut in the entire universe. By now, Ryan was shouting so loud that he made his Luigi substitute wince with every word. But first you will train for the mission with Henriette. She's going to chew you, and baptize your skull as her litter box. But it will make you strong, strong like a Russian cosmonaut. And Len will like it because it means we'll be exporting communism beyond our solar system. Ghoul cowered, as he realized the nightmare had only begun. You will bone the Martians, Ghoul. This is a 7 English podcast and you're listening to The Perfect Run. Chapter 120, Speedrunners Ryan picked up two ladies in Rust Town, with a skeletal zombie chained to his car hood. Seriously? Ryan asked his girlfriend with skeptical eyes. While Fortuna came to the mission with her sensual, white latex catsuit, Livia brought a pair of jeans and a blue hoodie. I'm not letting you in. I'm sorry, it's the only practical clothing I could grab in an hour, Livia apologized. Ryan's loops began while she was having a girl's day out with Fortuna, and although it allowed the two to slip away from the Augusti undetected in spite of Geist's sudden disappearance, it didn't give them enough time to find the perfect outfit. But it's cotton. Passable, Ryan replied with a shrug, before reluctantly letting them in. The courier had come fully prepared, with the Fisty Brothers gauntlets and two submachine guns waiting on the front seat. He had even gotten the bowler hat out of storage, ready for war, and convinced Polly to hand over his secret weapon. It was amazing how much one could achieve in an hour with the perfect timing and little traffic. Ryan would rather have more time to prepare, but they couldn't wait any longer. Big Fat Adam was about to throw his captives into the meat grinder any second now. Livy, you should have told me, Fortuna said as she and Livia climbed at the back. I had a backup suit. I know, but, her best friend responded with an awkward smile. I find it a little indecent. I it's not indecent, it's gawking. Fortuna complained with a blush, as Ryan drove through the district's desolate streets. And is that a real skeleton on the car hood? Help. Ghoul suddenly screamed at the car's front, startling Fortuna. The psycho had lost both his legs and hands, leaving only the head and rib cage chained below the windshield. Help me, he's mad. He's mad. Shush, my little astronaut. Ryan said with a soft, gentle tone. It made the undead psycho cower in fear. Living people are talking. Don't worry, he deserves it, Livia explained to Fortuna, before glancing at her boyfriend. Felix and the others will arrive a few minutes after us. Good, I can make a great first impression then. Ryan smashed the accelerator, and aimed straight for the junkyard. Ghoul screamed, as the district's toxic wind battered his naked eyes. Felix is coming too? Fortuna asked at the back, eminently curious. 
Since she acted as Livia's bodyguard and trusted her best friend absolutely, she must have come without asking many questions. He's coming back to us. No, Livia replied, but Ryan convinced him to make an effort and keep in touch. You did? Lucky girl glanced at the handsome driver with renewed respect. You know, I was about to say Livia was too good for you, but I take it back. Thank you, thank you, Ryan said, as he noticed the trash walls of the junkyard appearing in the distance. Where is my payment? The ammo? Fortuna gave Ryan a handful of pointed, arrow-shaped bullets. Ryan grabbed a gun while the Plymouth Fury drove by itself. You're in luck, the gun shop had some in stock. What did you need these bullets for? Whale hunting, Ryan replied, as he loaded the ammo in his gun and showcased it to his girlfriend. 16 rounds, 9 millimeters. It can quickly fire round after round without pause. Hard question. Livia gave him a playful look. Does it ever jam? Never, nor does it overheat. It can keep pumping out rounds all night long. Ryan gently caressed the tip of the barrel. Though I often need help with the safety catch. Good, I have a firm but gentle handle on these things, his girlfriend said with a coy voice, as she grabbed the fisty brothers and put them on. I could help with the, finger work. Be gentle though, Ryan warned, as he put his weapon inside his trench coat, right between the sleeping plushie and the bliss inhaler. The barrel is one of a kind and the trigger is very sensitive. One wrong move, and it'll fire too soon. Are you talking about weapons or something else? Fortuna asked, as red as a tomato. I have Polly's rocket launcher below your seat, if you want to try a heavier caliber, Ryan said innocently. I hope you're open to new experiences, because your target is a she. Before Fortuna could protest, Len's voice came out of the chrono radio. I'm in position, Riri. What about Henriette and Eugene Henry? Ryan asked back, as they came into view of the junkyard. Hills of trash and stacks of cars overshadowed a fence, shielded by the reptilian and Gemini. Both observed the car approaching in confusion, while Ghoul screamed in terror. At the orphanage with Sarah. Perfect. Ghoul? The reptilian shouted upon recognizing his teammate, his reptilian eyes widening in terror. In response, Ryan opened his window and pointed a finger at the US government's secret lizard man master. Witness me. Gemini's light body instantly vanished in a flash of light, while the reptilian narrowly managed to leap out of the way before the crazed driver could hit him. Ryan's car smashed through the fence at full speed. Ryan drove through the junkyard's labyrinth of trash walls like a conquered realm, ignoring the psychos scavenging in the area. Mungrel glanced at the intruders from atop a rusted car, his teeth sinking into a living rat's back. Having grown to know the guy in previous loops, the sight filled Ryan with compassion. Mungrel truly didn't deserve being turned into an animal, and the courier would make sure to help him take his life back. Instead of attacking, Ryan tossed grenades behind him to collapse some of the trash walls and disrupt ground-based reinforcements. His own would come from above anyway. By the time someone sounded the alarm and the sound of bells echoed in the junkyard, Ryan's group was almost in view of the bunker's entrance. The driver sensed the heavy gaze of the land on him, and a quake sent debris falling on his car. Having lived through this situation multiple times, the time traveler easily zigzagged around the improvised projectiles. When Ryan reached the junkyard's landmark trash tower and the tunnel leading to the bunker, he noticed two shadows flying in the skies above. Two would-be heroes, floating on glass surfboards. Unfortunately, toxic clouds already formed above the junkyard, as acid rain and mosquito moved to protect the tunnel's entrance. Thieves, the former snarled as she drew knives. Much like Mungrel before her, the sight of her maddened expression made Ryan pity her. Thee. Blondie, shoot. The courier shouted, as he veered his car to the left. Shoot the other blonde. Double blondie. All right. Fortuna opened the car's door mid-motion and leaped out of it, Polly's rocket launcher in hand. She pressed the trigger before she even landed on her feet, aiming for acid rain. The surprised psycho took a step back as a rocket with a smiley face painted on the tip flew straight at her. 
She immediately teleported above a trash wall as an acid drizzle started raining down from the toxic clouds above. It helped little, for the Genius Tech missile followed and forced her to retreat, it would take minutes for the projectile to run out of fuel, keeping acid rain occupied. Mosquito, meanwhile, extended his wings and rushed at the Plymouth Fury with a fist raised. He only noticed the shadow above him all too late, a black and white angel of death and destruction. Timmy had leaped from his glass surfboard, and transformed mid-flight. Flying press. The gracefully landed on Mosquito like a fly swatter, and buried him alive beneath pounds of fur and fat. Felix's landing was far more gracious, as his glass surfboard landed in the middle of the courtyard. Ryan parked his Plymouth Fury right next to it, stepping out of the car alongside Livia with grace and dignity. Felix. Fortuna rejoiced at her brother's presence, tossing the empty rocket launcher away. Livia handed her best friend a submachine gun as a replacement, while Ryan claimed the other for himself. You know, sis, I always wondered how a team-up would go, Adam Cat replied, before noticing Mongrel leaping into view atop a trash wall. The maddened psycho summoned a fireball into his hand. Remember, kitten, no lethal force, Ryan said. Stick to pebbles. Yeah, yeah, I've got this, he replied before grabbing empty tin cans from the trash walls, turning them into bombs, and tossing them at Mongrel. His projectiles and the psychos hit each other in the air, sparking a devastating blast. Unfortunately, the explosion caused a weakened trash wall to collapse on itself and cast a rain of debris on Fortuna, the end mosquito. Felix's eyes immediately widened in panic, as he realized his screw-up. Sis, he shouted as loudly as he could. Sis. While Timmy managed to drag his unconscious enemy out of danger, Lucky Girl was too close to dodge. She looked at the collapsing debris with shock, as her power somehow failed to deflect them. Ryan almost froze time and rushed to her rescue, before noticing Livia smiling. A second later, an invisible force grabbed the living lottery ticket, carrying her above the ground and to safety. By now, Ryan should have known better. We'll take it from here, quick save, Shroud declared as he became visible, holding a blushing Fortuna in his arms bridal style. And her power didn't even need to force his hand this time around. Clean up the nest. Felix didn't hide his relief. Thanks, he said to Matthias, before focusing back on Mongrel. His sister's reaction was far less refined. Felix, you screw up, you almost dirted my clothes, she complained, shouting so loudly that Shroud winced. I will strangle you if the mutants don't kill you first. I would suggest drowning him, he doesn't like being wet, Ryan replied, as he and Livia moved into the shaking tunnel. Before he abandoned the surface, the courier gave the situation a cursory glance. These events were so familiar, yet different. A scenario honed through multiple repetitions, built upon information he had collected over many loops, executed by allies he had gathered on his journey. After so long, it was all coming together. And yet he immediately noticed something utterly new. Something he never imagined would happen, except in his wildest dreams. His Plymouth Fury. His Plymouth Fury hadn't taken any damage. It's a holy sign, Ryan muttered to himself with religious awe. And if we do our part right, it will make it through the day intact, Livia said with a grin. Perfect run confirmed. The couple rushed into the tunnel while its walls trembled, the land attempting to collapse them. The duo quickly reached the bunker's black door entrance and faced a pack of four Dynamis drones. I take the left, you take the rye, Ryan asked his girlfriend, before sensing a chill down his SP. When Ryan regained consciousness, the couple was walking through the blast doors while leaving four wrecked bots in their wake. You were saying? Livia asked, teasing him by caressing the fisty brothers. You're greedy, Miss Augusti, Ryan complained, as the tunnel collapsed behind them. Greedy, me? She replied with a smirk, as they entered the metal corridor leading to the bunker's main hall. You are the one keeping the best stuff for yourself. And here I was preparing you a big surprise, Ryan glanced through the reinforced windows to the hangars beyond, and at Psyshock's thralls toiling on Mechran's mech and submarine. He noticed Len's armored head peeking over the waters linking the underground complex to the sea outside, and waved at her through the reinforced glass. 
A surprise, Mr. Romano? Livia asked, suddenly interested. I love surprises. For the Dynami's date, Princess, Ryan said, as Len suddenly emerged from the waters and attacked the thralls with her bubble rifle. The Dynami's date. I can't wait, she said, as they entered the bunker's recreational area. Much like in Ryan's suicide run, six psychos occupied the room. Saren, the liquid ink machine, and the faceless incognito played pool alongside the sickly white, bald pale guy. Rakshasa played street fighter on the room's arcade, while a disembodied Asian woman's head floated behind the bar counter. Ryan remembered her name as the dreaded fuckface. Saren hit a ball with a cue stick, before looking up at the newcomers. She didn't say a word, and for a brief instant, the courier worried that the transfer hadn't worked. Thankfully, they had agreed on a secret code to test that out. The fart is in the toilet, Ryan said, before clocking his submachine gun. I repeat, the fart is in the toile. I heard you for the first time, jackass. Bianca let out a sigh as she put her cue stick aside. Took you long enough. You know these guys, Saren? Ink Machine asked, falsely reassured by her teammates' casualness. They're new recruits? The new management, Bianca replied, before suddenly pointing her vibrating gauntlets at both Ink Machine and Rakshasa. She blasted them both by surprise, turning the former into a puddle and blasting the latter headfirst into the arcade. Bianca, you heartless monster. Ryan mourned the arcade game, before opening fire at the other psychos. Though he was careful not to kill any of them, he didn't even manage to wound them. Incognito dived behind the pool table for protection, while Fuckface materialized crimson arms of energy to deflect the bullets. Pale Guy simply dodged, but Livia quickly moved to engage him in melee. Saren, you traitor. Fuckface snarled from behind the counter. Incognito, call Frank. Incognito hastily rushed towards the elevator, but Ryan quickly shot him in the knees with his submachine gun. The metagang member collapsed on the ground with bloodied legs, writhing in pain. Sorry, you'll live, Ryan apologized to the faceless psycho, before turning his submachine gun at the bar counter. We meet again, fuckface. Won't say I missed you though. That's not my name, the floating head complained, before spitting a stream of acid at the time traveler. Ryan frowned behind his mask as he froze time and dodged. Her name was, it was. Wait, she was right. The courier had nicknamed her fuckface on his first suicide run and never bothered to look deeper afterward. Pale guy too, now that he thought of it. They hadn't survived their group civil war either during his metagang run, so he never got to know them in death either. No way, I never learned these two mooks names. Ryan complained as time resumed. By then, he had closed the gap with fuckface, tossed his submachine gun aside, and grabbed her by the hair. Before the psycho could retaliate with her energy arms, the courier violently smashed her head against the bar counter with enough force to splinter it, knocking her unconscious. Her energy tentacles vanished into red flux particles. Bianca, what are these red shirts called? Does it matter, nerd? Bianca asked, as she started targeting Pale Guy. The psycho dodged her blast, but Livia exploited the opportunity to flank him from another direction. Repeated attacks from multiple fronts quickly pushed him back against a corner. Yes it does, Ryan said, as he stepped over a bloodied incognito and an unconscious Rakshasa. I'm a completionist. Catcher and Penangolin, Livia replied as she finally managed to hit Pale Guy in the chest with Fisty. The blow sent the psycho hitting the nearest wall, knocking him out of the fight. Pfft, fuckface sounded better. Ryan would make changing her name a top priority, when he took back his office of the metagang's president for life. Still, the courier could now carry on his perfect run with a clear conscience and moved towards the elevator. Alright, can you drag these guys to shorty for safekeeping? Ryan asked his teammates, with the same tone as someone running through a shopping list. And help her with the thralls outside? There's a lot of them. Sure, but don't take too long downstairs, Livia said while dragging the dizzied fuckface away. Bianca, meanwhile, kept Ink Machine trapped in puddle form with weak vibrations. I want to invite everyone afterward to celebrate, and the restaurant closes early. 
Also, dad will start worrying now that Geist is gone. Thai, or French? Ryan asked before pushing the lifts button, knowing that she disliked Japanese food. Russian, to try something new. His girlfriend replied right as the elevator's doors closed. Oh well, at least Shorty would like it. The lift reached its destination, and Ryan quickly made his way through the bunker's hub room and metal corridor. He hastily reached the infirmary, and found Psyshock brainwashing two Rust Town addicts strapped to operation tables. He raised his head at Ryan, while the courier's hand reached out for the bliss inhaler hidden beneath his trench coat. Little Chesare. Pishok didn't show any fear at the sudden intrusion, overconfident in his immortality. How strange to. Ryan froze time and applied the inhaler to his hated foe's face right before the clock resumed. Don't worry, PSY PSY, Ryan taunted Psyshock, before activating the inhaler. This, is not meth. The surprised Psycho's tentacles trashed around as bliss spread through his nervous system, but Ryan held strong. Psyshock's energy quickly left him as the overdose paralyzed his brain, and the psychotic metal squid collapsed on the ground. The courier gave him a quick kick, before hiding the bliss inhaler in a pocket. Agent Frank. Ryan called out, knowing the metal giant was waiting a few rooms away. That was how Psyshock had sicked him on the courier halfway through the first suicide run. Agent Frank, hurry. Russian agents poisoned the VP with Soviet caviar. The colossal giant of steel came rushing inside the infirmary, to find a maskless Ryan holding the drugged Psyshock in his arms, crocodile tears running down his cheeks. Agent Frank, US Secret Service. The giant threatened Ryan with a raised fist. Identify yourself. Ryan Romano, CIA. Ryan sobbed. We survived Pearl Harbor together. Us and Sergeant Arch Dornan. Don't you remember the boat, Agent Frank? The boat? A confused Frank the Mad waved an index finger at Ryan, as he remembered a day that never happened. You were the private. The private on the boat. Thank God Livia predicted how to get inside his head. You saved my life, Agent Frank, and today, I pay my debt. Ryan wiped away his false tears. I did all I could to save him, but the air, the communists poisoned even the air, Agent Frank. I knew they put something in the airplanes. Frank immediately looked at the drooling Psyshock with a worried gaze. What can we do? I did all I could to save him, but this is a communist coup, Agent Frank. They're trying to destroy the government. Only now did Agent Frank understand the true threat their democracy faced. The president is down there. The giant panicked. We must secure his safety. No, Agent Frank, not we. It's a suicide mission. Ryan delicately gave the drooling Psyshock to Frank, who held him in his arms like a secret treasure. I will do it. You stay here and protect the Vice President from a Russian counterattack, until Agent Saren comes back with medical help. The US Secret Service does not. Democracy can only survive if, Ryan cleared his throat, his voice as heavy as a soldier marching to certain death. If you live, Agent Frank. If the president dies, the vice president, the vice presidency must endure. Do you understand this, Agent Frank? Ryan let out a long, long sigh, as he put his mask and bowler hat on. Let me die for my country, he pleaded, before adjusting his hat, as a hero. I understand, Frank the mad lad replied, before offering Ryan a military salute with one hand while holding Psyshock in the other. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Ryan returned the salute, before walking out of the infirmary with a heavy heart. There. According to Livia, if dealt in that way, Frank would follow orders and remain in the infirmary until the group could secure the rest of the bunker. So far the metagang's route was total, but the main course waited a few rooms ahead. Leaving the neutralized Frank and Psyshock behind, Ryan continued deeper into the complex and reached a familiar underground chamber. Seven knockoff elixir vats were lined up on a nearby wall, half of them occupied by mutated test subjects. One of the chamber's two blast doors was opened, and the courier heard footsteps echo from this direction. You know, since I've been in New Rome, I've fought aliens, psychos, and power-mad genomes, and few left a big impression. 
Ryan grabbed his Beretta, as his foe stepped out of the darkness. But you, fat ass. Your shadow cast a heavy presence. Augustus was stronger and Fallout more determined, but the metagang's leader was shrewder, crueler, and in the end, more dangerous. That was why he had to die first. What can I say, mate? I've hurt lots of people, and today will be an all-you-can-eat buffet. Adam the Ogre emerged from the shadow with a hand behind his back, his carbon skin as black as his soul, the grin on his face vicious and cruel. But gotta say. I've never tasted a fellow violet before. Make that last loop count, by Bendham, Ryan said, as he raised his gun. You won't get another. Please subscribe to A7 English Podcasts and enjoy listening every day with us. Thank you.